Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to Confetti's Industry Week. Um, this talk is with Michael Wild. Uh, he's been a VFX artist for over seven years and specializes in 3D modeling and texturing. So he's going to be talking all about his career, university and beyond. Um, so in the chat, if you've got any questions, make sure you use the link in the chat and we'll sort of answer them kind of at the end. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's session and thank you for Michael for taking time out to join us for our 15th Confetti, Confetti Industry Week. Uh, don't forget you can still book onto any upcoming events by going to iw.confetti.ac.uk and as part of our industry we're running a competition where you can win some cool prizes. All you have to do is tag us on Twitter or Instagram using iw20 sharing your experiences throughout the week. So I'll hand you over to Michael so off you go thank you very much. Hello hi um, thanks for that Jake. Um, my name is Michael Wilds. Um, I've been a visual effects artist for um, yeah going on seven and a half years, I think now. Um, and thanks for joining me. This is gonna be a talk about my time at university, um, kind of where that took me and then beyond. I understand some of you will be in college, some of you will be studying on the university course. So yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that fairly candidly. I'm gonna try and watch my language, <laughs> which is something I'm prone to doing when I'm talking to people on the internet. Um, but no, I'm going to be talking about my experiences and kind of how I got to where I am and stuff like that. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in whatever I think they're doing a form or whatever. Um, and I will answer them as honestly as I can later on in the talk. There's going to be kind of two parts of this talk. First of all, my kind of journey into the effects. And secondly, for like the last half an hour, I'm going to go over my process for creating a 3D asset um, inside of 3D, as it were. Um, yeah, so uh, I've got a PowerPoint, which we're going to go through. I've tried to make it slightly less boring than your average PowerPoint. Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You can be the judges of that. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, I've just seen there's eight or nine of you joining, which um, makes me slightly more nervous. But I'm also very excited. So a little bit of both. Um, cool. So can we see my screen? Yeah, we can see that. Cool. So yeah, this is a career in VFX. University and Beyond, a snazzy little title, or as I'd like to call it, as I've been writing this, um, oh, my key don't work. How writing a presentation made me realize that I'm old. So I went to university 10 years ago, and I know that for two reasons. One, for the research of this presentation, and two, because Facebook keeps showing me um, memories from university 10 years ago um, of videos of being very drunk in halls, doing deplorable things. So um, yeah, who am I? Great question. Uh, my name is Michael, hopefully I've explained a little bit of that. Um, yeah, I've been a uh, modeling and texturing artist for the last seven and a half years, but I've done a lot of other things. I've done lighting, I've done grooming, I've done a little bit of look dev. I've kind of done it all, but these days I'm modeling and texturing artist, usually known for my texturing. Um, yeah, so why 3D? Um, that's a great question. A lot of you will be watching this and you'll be like, oh, I really wanna get into VFX because of Star Wars or because of, um, what's another big one? Uh, Game of Thrones and stuff like that. Well, for me, have you heard of this thing called Shrek? I loved Shrek growing up. It's not the only reason I'm in VFX, but um, basically I remember it's a, one of the memories that sticks in my head. I was at my grandma's in Portsmouth watching Shrek the Halls, a straight to TV um, version of Shrek um, that for some reason I was watching it and there's a bit where they're walking through the snow and I was just like, oh my God, I really want to do that. Just like the way the snow was deforming. I don't know. It just set something off in my brain. Also, um, there was this film called Final Fantasy Spirits Within, which I think is generally panned. I think people absolutely hate it. But there's a shot in that where like she's walking on the floor, but like the floor is glass and the camera's underneath and it does all these weird footprint things. I don't know. Those things, I was just like, wow, that's amazing. So yeah, nothing fancy like Star Wars or anything like that. It was um, Shrek the Horse. Um, I also, I grew up in quite a creative, but also mathematical household. My mum's really arty and my dad really likes um, computers. So I grew up kind of learning Photoshop because he, he restored um, kind of old photos and stuff like that. My mum would always be painting. So I kind of had the maths and the kind of creative aspect of it, um, which I think at VFX in a weird way is, depending on which avenue you kind of go down, it can be really, really techy or it can be really, really creative. There's a mix of both. Um, so yeah, I've been a VFX artist for seven and a half years. Um, now I'm modeling a texturing artist. When I started off um, in my, sorry, I'm just trying to <laughs> work out. Um, now um, I'm doing what I wanted to, but when I first started, it took me a while to get into the kind of role that I um, wanted to. When I was at uni, I wanted to get into modeling and texturing, but I kind of had to take a little bit of a long way around. Um, yeah, and I'm going to talk about that more slightly on. 
uh, slightly later on. And I also teach it in my spare time online. Um, I do YouTube tutorials for um, pieces of software, Mari and uh, mainly Mari, but ZBrush and Maya and other bits and pieces, which are kind of the industry standard software. Um, I kind of teach tip, uh, tips and tricks of using those pieces of software online. Um, and uh, yeah, the reason that I do that is because there's a kind of a real mixed level of kind of content out there, if, especially on YouTube, if you go on YouTube. Um, and a lot of it isn't kind of industry standard workflows. So I found a lot of students, especially that were kind of using YouTube as kind of like a secondary, like, I mean, I did it when I was at uni. I was watching a lot of that stuff kind of to fill in the gaps of my knowledge. And um, I'm, I've kind of seen a lot of that and it's mainly to do with Blender, but I won't get started on that. A lot of it just kind of isn't the, the workflows that you should be using. So I kind of wanted to help with that a little bit. Cool, so um, I've also worked on a few films. Um, so now is the slightly braggy bit. Um, this is the Thunderbird from Fantastic Beast One um, before JK Rowling was controversial. Um, so that was a fun asset that I got to work on, but these are also all some of the other films that I've worked on. So Cinderella, um, Jungle Book and Blade Runner, they've both got the little emoji next to them because they've won Oscars, um, all because of me, no, I'm joking. Uh, I was like one of thousands of people that worked on them. Um, yeah, so I've worked on some pretty cool films, which has been fun. Um, so I'm going to quickly show my show reel just to kind of, I, I don't know, I always, I feel like it's a useful thing to show also because it kind of gives somebody, like, if you see what somebody's worked on, you kind of, it's like, oh, I can kind of trust what they're saying. But also it seems a little bit braggy, so I apologise in advance, but um, we'll just get this over and done with. And I'll, I'm going to actually, you know, I'll, I'll mute it and I'll talk. Uh, sorry. There's like a million and one pop-ups with Zoom that's covering my screen, which you won't see. I'm trying to get that. Okay, we're going to do it without music. Anyway. So this is Detective Pikachu. Um, this asset was called Torterra Large because it is a very large Torterra, which is a giant Pokemon in the Pokemon universe at uh, the size of mountains. So this guy I modeled and textured um, when I was at NPC in London and the kind of mountain on top was done by a different team. The worst thing about this is I killed myself for six months and it's all covered in shadow and you can't see any of the like nice detail. I spent ages ZBrush, uh, ZBrushing, if that's a verb, we'll say it is. Um, so yeah, that was a cool project. This was Elite Battle Angel. Um, Weta did the most of Weta did most of the work for this, but I did Screwhead here um, for two of the sequences in the bar fight and the rollerball kind of meeting room or whatever. I can't remember what the sport's called in that film. Um, but yeah, that was a really cool fun project. Um, that was at Dineg in Vancouver. This lady here. Uh, this was from The Boys. Um, if you've seen that show. Uh, it's very, very good. I remember working on this, it was a nightmare and I didn't have any idea about the TV show. So I held off watching it for like two years and then finally watched it. I was like, oh my God, I worked on one of the coolest things ever. So I made a digi double of A-Train here um, who just did a um, heinous thing. Um, this is uh, Frank from Fantastic Beasts, the Thunderbird. Um, uh, this was my first texturing role in the industry, which was wild. Um, I did a few bits at DNEG and they kind of trusted me and they're like, hey, do you want to texture this giant Thunderbird thing? I was like, yeah, go on then. Um, Pacific Rim here. So I was sculpting ice for way too long. And that's what I did with Pacific Rim, just a lot of ice sculpting. This is um, uh, Deadpool 2. Um, and I'm going to skip past the little bit here because there's something like, if you've seen Deadpool, there's some inappropriate parts, but there's the bit with the baby. I also worked on that. If you want to, you can watch this later. Um, but yeah, so Blade Runner um, did some of the buildings. That was kind of hard surface modeling. This is The Mummy, <laughs> one of the worst things I worked on. Um, but this was, it was a cool project. This was um, my first project in Vancouver when I moved over there. Um, just, a, just a bad film. And then Jungle Book, which was, was a really long one and fun one. Um, and then back to Frank. And then I think this is some personal work that I've done. Uh, this is uh, Lion Cat from a comic book called Saga um that i wanted to recreate um yeah so that's kind of my showreel sorry if you can hear a telephone ringing in the background um so let's go back to the presentation um so that's kind of what i've done over my career obviously i've done a lot of other stuff but a showreel is kind of your best bits the bits you kind of want to show off so i thought I'd, oh it's playing again are we back cool so also in my spare time, um, I work on portfolio pieces and stuff. A lot of it is kind of content for YouTube and like um, that sort of the two kind of go hand in hand. I'll often want to make something and then I'll try and make a tutorial around, a tutorial around it as well. So this is Squirtle um, from Pokemon. 
as you can tell, I have a thing for Pokemon. Um, this is Greg from Over the Garden Wall. If you haven't heard of Over the Garden Wall, I would I cannot recommend it enough. It's one of the greatest TV shows. It's like one series, you can watch it in probably two hours on Cartoon Network. Used to be on Netflix, it's not anymore. Um, very sad. And this is Trixie Mattel. And if you don't know who she is, then that's a hate crime. Um, but no, so these are some things that I've made in my spare time. Um, Reddit likes to call them ungodly. I like to call them um, uncanny. Uh, but yeah, so this is these are things that you can find from me on the internet. Uh, cool, so why is the, okay, these should go one at a time, but they're not. So um, what is VFX? What's the first thing? How long has it been around for? Well, the first film to use VFX, I think, according to my research, was Tron in 1982, which will be older than, uh, that'll be before some of you, it was before me. Um, so uh, that was 10 years before I was born. I was born in 92. Uh, and probably 20 years before some of you guys. And this is what Tron looked like. So um, yeah, bad. It looked really, really bad. But that said, it was the first thing to ever kind of come out. It was completely groundbreaking. People say it's a great film. I tried watching it. It's not a good film. I think um, it probably, in the same way that Avatar is kind of held to a high respect because it was kind of groundbreaking at the time. Maybe that's why Tron is looked on so favorably. I don't know. Um, maybe some of you will love it. And um, But yeah. So what is, um, oh, also, sorry. So everybody, everybody likes to say that Jurassic Park and Terminator 2 are some of the first VFX films, but they're not really, Tron was. But those were two of the ones that kind of brought it into the mainstream. So Jurassic Park with, if you've seen it, the big T-Rex sequence where they're getting chased and Terminator 2, which I haven't seen, um, which is a very unpopular opinion if I ever say that in a VFX studio, um, but I haven't seen it, but there's a sequence where the um, Terminator guy I don't know, the one that isn't Arnie walks through a jail and turns to like silver liquid and goes through. And that was another kind of groundbreaking Hollywood VFX. And this was a time before VFX was used in every single film. There, it was just kind of these one-off things that kind of changed the landscape of cinema to these VFX blockbusters that we kind of see today. Um, so um, when is CGI used? I'm gonna flip that question and say, when isn't CGI used? Uh, this is something I could talk about for way too long, but I'm sure um, you've met those people, maybe you are one of those people that um, is like, ah, oh, films these days have got too much CGI, it's disgusting. Like, oh, I want, uh, they're ruining cinema, but they're not. Like every single film that you watch, even if it's the ones that aren't traditionally filled with explosions, filled with car chases or like, God knows what, um, they will have hundreds, if not thousands of shots of CGI. Whether that's kind of wire removal on actors that are in harnesses, whether that's kind of um, background replacement. If you if it's an old Victorian period piece, you can't afford to change all of London into Victorian England. So you'll have a matte painting or you'll just clean up the end of the street, which will be a green screen and then you'll populate it with houses. Um, what are other things? De-aging um, actors happens <laughs> way more than um, way more than you'd think. I'm not going to name any names, but there's a lot. Um, a lot of that stuff is done kind of in post production as well, and that's all VFX. It's all CGI. It's just kind of people see the big shiny explosions and they're like, "There's too much CGI." And then Christopher Nolan does a puff piece about how he did no CGI in his film, even though it's probably not true. I don't know. Um, so yeah. When isn't it used is the question rather than when is CGI used these days in film. Uh, and how is it created? Well, that's a big old question. Um, this is Jungle Book. So I worked on this. This is one of my favorite things. I remember looking at dailies on this. And so here's the little, this is like a puppeteer. I think they were from Jim, Dam Jim Davison's, um, the the Muppets guy, they, he had like, has a creature workshop. And so these are like puppeteers being all the things that Mowgli interacts with. And you can see here, we've got these little puppet eyes socked things. Um, and the puppeteers could never look at Mowgli because he might accidentally make eye contact. So the, it would always be these people looking like really demure and don't have demure is the right word, but really like serious, like looking away whilst doing all this like funny sock puppet stuff. Um, yeah, so that's a little background on VFX. Um, CGI obviously stands for computer generated imagery. VFX kind of that term comes from special effects, which is SFX, which is kind of the explosions that you would have on set and VFX is kind of the virtual thing of that. Um, yeah, cool. So life as a VFX artist. Uh, what I do, um, I kind of get to work or used to get to work these days. Uh, this is my office in my childhood bedroom with very green green walls. So I apologize for the slightly um, unprofessional environment, but you do what you can these days. Um, get to work and um, usually I will present whatever I've been working on. So um, 
I'll be like, hey, here's the changes I've made in the last day, the notes that you gave me, I've worked on those. Um, or I'd get given a new task if I'd kind of finished something, be like, hey, here's the next asset you need to make, whether that's modeling, whether that's texturing. Um, often they'd give you, they'd be like, we need this kind of done in three days. Sometimes they won't give you a time limit. They'd be like, just show us it in the next time. Um, we do rounds. Rounds obviously used to, back in the olden times, they would come to your desk and look at your work. These days it's all kind of done via Zoom. Um, and then you kind of have dailies, which is where you present your work with the supervisor, with your lead, um, you get feedback from them. They would be like, I like this, but I don't really like this part. Can you change it? Or I've been looking at the reference from on set and this character that you're creating. I think they actually have a black t-shirt and you've given them a white t-shirt. So stuff like that. Um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you would have noticed what color the t-shirt is. Um, and then you would get the rest of the day or whenever you would address those notes for the next, um, next rounds. Uh, yeah, and you kind of just do it all over again. And that's a work day in VFX. Um, and then kind of the more senior you get, the more responsibilities you get. So I've been doing this for a while now. And um, sometimes people will come to me for notes or sometimes people will be like, hey, can you help out this person? Then you, can you show them the ropes or can you teach them this piece of software? Things like that. So um, yeah, that's kind of um, a day in a VFX environment kind of in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> I've got to put this in here. Also, um, I I think half of my days as well is problem solving. I think life as a VFX artist is just kind of problem solving. Often <laughs> I'll be banging my head against the screen and be like, why does this software not work? Why is this not working? Why is this not working? And you kind of draw on your knowledge of previous things, be like, well, on this film I worked on, I did this and that kind of blah, blah, blah. So it is a lot of problem solving. Um, that's the one great thing about working in a team is you can kind of be like, hey, so-and-so, can you help me with this? And hopefully they can. Obviously the more senior you get, then the more times people will be like, hey, Michael, can you help me with this? And then you're just like, ah, uh, yes. Um, but I think um, one of the things I'm gonna talk about later is have some, uh, have some humility with that. If you don't know something, it's fine. Um, I don't know everything. Um, I should have probably said that up front at the beginning of this presentation. I don't know everything. I'm never gonna pretend to. Um, but yeah, a lot of VFX is problem solving, which is kind of when I was saying earlier that it is quite a technical thing, even though it can be really creative sometimes. A lot of the times you are fighting against the technicalities of working with computers, working with quite advanced software. Um, yeah, so VFX. So what are your career options? Well, so there's VFX, which is kind of like film work, TV work, and that kind of comes in lots of shapes and sizes. So I'm a modeling and texturing artist. Some of you guys will be in college now, so you might not even know what that is. I probably should have explained that. Basically, um, the analogy that I like to use is if you're making a puppet. So if you think about a puppet traditionally on strings, um, to make a stringed puppet, you need to carve it out of wood. So that would kind of be the modeling. So actually creating the forms of that puppet. Uh, then it would need painting. So that is texturing. So making it look, rather than making it look wooden, you wanna make it look like a, a real boy or whatever Pinocchio says. Um, then to make that puppet actually dance, you'd add, need to add some strings so that the controller, the puppeteer can kind of move it and that's rigging. So rigging is kind of adding all these joints and stuff onto your 3D mesh so that it can move around. Then you've got the animators, which is the puppeteer basically jiggling the strings. Um, you'll, you'll have heard of animation. They're often, they're the big cheeses in VFX in, or in animation. Everybody loves to rave about animators. Um, and then compers, uh, that doesn't really stick with the, um, the puppeteering metaphor, but basically when you're working on a film, you'll have all your um, kind of plates is what we call them, or basically shot footage. So if it's um, uh, Tom Holland doing whatever he does in Spider-Man, zipping around the cinema, um, zipping around the city, there'll be the green screen shots of him actually like on a soundstage somewhere in Hollywood. And then the comper will take that, get rid of all the green screen and kind of composite it with the 3D city that people have made. So the compositor is at the end of the pipeline and they kind of put everything together. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different avenues in VFX. So if you ever meet somebody that's a VFX artist, they're never usually everything. You can kind of get generalists, which is something that I've done. Um, and they they might do a, a range of things, but generally, at least in the bigger houses, when you've got hundreds of people, you'll usually specialize in one thing. Um, some of you guys that are studying at uni will know that now because you'll be kind of thinking about where do you want to specialize, uh, but I'll talk about that more slightly later on. So. Um, on top of VFX, we also have feature animation. So feature animation is basically exactly the same thing. You don't have any plates. You don't have any of that filmed footage. So you don't need actors on sets. Um, yeah, which has been great in, um, in terms of 
COVID times, it's been great because you haven't had to have actors kind of on set. So it's been a little bit more pandemic proof than VFX. Again, this is something I'll touch on later, um, how COVID has kind of changed the industry slightly. But yeah, feature animation has has blossomed. Um, and it's actually, I'm working, I'm doing animation at the moment rather than VFX stuff, which is kind of where my background has laid. Um, the last two jobs I've had actually have been feature animation just because it's easier to make in this day and age. So they're hiring more for it. Um, so then we've also got kind of video games, real-time VR. So a lot of the stuff that you will learn, whether you're learning VFX at university, whether you're learning video games, kind of um, real-time engines, a lot of the skills are transferable. You're still modeling in 3D, you're still texturing, you're still painting your assets in 3D, you're still animating them. Just the kind of practices are slightly different because obviously uh, PlayStation 5 has to run 60 frames, 4K a second, whereas a computer, you can render one frame for 30 minutes. Um, and you've got a lot more time. So kind of the way that they, the way that it it um, is processed is quite different, but the actual skills that you're doing um, somewhat similar and quite interchangeable. So it's another kind of career option. And I know people that have jumped across, I'm current, I've been trying to learn Unreal for a while. Um, <laughs> I've struggled, but um, they're definitely interchangeable. Um, <laughs> you kids like that Fortnite? Uh, basically, yeah, I kind of see um, real time um, a bit as the future. Uh, I don't know, especially because in VFX they want to get render times down. So if you if you go online and Google like Weta, which is the guys that made like Lord of the Rings and Avatar, they're looking into a lot of Unreal stuff. They're making their own shorts in kind of Unreal because um, the technology isn't quite there yet. But I, I do think in the future um, VFX is going to want to get rid of render times. So I don't know. Um, just my personal opinion is that maybe in 20 years we'll all be using Unreal Engine. Um, then you've got other options as well on top of the other ones I've already mentioned. You've got ads, you've got Arch Viz, which is kind of like those, when you see a, a tower block go up in London before they actually build it, they want to sell all the flats, right? So you do these beautiful renders of what the flat could look like and here's your dream. And it's always like the backs of people walking through like streets that aren't built yet. I always find them really funny. But um, so that's Arch Viz and then advertising as well. So I've worked, I've done advertising stuff as um I've, I've worked on ads. I did some stuff for a night campaign and for Adidas. Um, sometimes that stuff is, um, it can be a bit more stable, especially like the Archviz stuff. Um, but some of it, for example, ads, you'll be doing like three weeks just in really intense work. You'll probably get paid quite a lot more, but then you kind of need to find your next gig after that. Um, and then <laughs> I feel like it's worth mentioning, but there's like weird other stuff as well that, um, I remember I got offered a job for an influencer on Instagram. They're like, hey, can you, we want to texture this person. And then they sent me a picture of their page and it was incredibly explicit. And I was like, no, I'm not working on that sort of stuff. But I, um, it, it's, it's an option as well. There's basically what I'm trying to say is there's quite a broad range for these skills. Um, yeah, anyway. So my time at uni, this was me uh, eight years ago, I think. Uh, I guess I should explain the photo really quickly. Um, the reason I'm holding a cat, I, I don't have an explanation for that, but basically I, this was my graduation day. I was incredibly sick. I had like really bad food poisoning. Um, I couldn't even, we were in, I went to Hertfordshire and we were in St. Albans Cathedral and I was like actually like bent over on the seat because I couldn't stand up straight because I knew it was coming out of one end um, and I didn't want to test which. So um, yeah, I photoshopped the photo because the picture they took, I was just pale as a ghost. So I photoshopped the photo to actually give me a bit more color because it's in my lounge downstairs. And I was like, I don't want this sickly looking thing hanging up for the rest of my life. So I added a cat to the scroll because I thought that's fun, isn't it? Um, cool. So I studied 3D animation at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, that was, yeah, 10 years ago I started now. So 2011 to 2013, I guess. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just gonna get my notes to the right page as well because I feel like I'm slightly out of thing. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, for me, yeah, I um, I didn't for sure know that I wanted to do 3D animation. Obviously, I told you about Shrek, um, but that was probably when I was like 14 or so. And I dabbled in Maya. Um, <laughs> my dad used to go to the Far East every year. He was a pilot. Um, and he, um, he used to come back from the Far East with like loads of, I shouldn't be saying this on a recorded broadcast, but loads of like pirated software discs because they just sell them in like marketplaces there. And he'd come back with like all these CDs for like 20p. And I remember he came back with this thing called Maya and it was like Maya 3 at the time. And I was like, oh, I'll give this a go. Um, 
and this is I don't even know if the internet the internet must have been a thing then but this is long time before the internet was like a, what it is these days so I didn't have any like resources and I remember building trying to build stuff in my and I did like the traditional like physics simulation of like throwing a bowling ball down a um and hitting skittles anyway so I kind of um I knew a little bit about 3D is basically what I'm trying to say. So I looked around at courses and I um, half a chair caught my eye and um, I was kind of like looking at a few. And um, the reason I ended up going here and I'd recommend this kind of just to anyone, just do your research and um, kind of with everything in life, but um, university is quite a big step. Um, you'll see online a lot of, there's there's a lot of opinions about university in general. And I think the, the people sometimes come to me, they'll be like, hey, I'm thinking of where should I study and blah, 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 and things like that. And I think it's such a personal thing and you really just need to do your research because it is, it's a big commitment, but it also, for me, um, going to university was the best decision I ever made because I'm only here because of it. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about 3D at university. It's incredibly hard. Like I, um, I remember <laughs> struggling so much I, I nearly wasn't let in actually to the the course that I applied to because like my portfolio wasn't good enough which is quite funny now considering where I am um but yeah they nearly didn't let me on but um I see a lot of people online as well they're like my university like they didn't teach me this they didn't teach me this and the problem is realistically like I don't, I don't know how many lecturers there are but like Jake can't teach you everything or like one person can't teach you everything that just isn't the the way it's ever going to work and I see that uh, the same my experience at uni as well so you are going to have to put in a lot of hard work yourself I remember the amount of like extra hours I put um but it was so rewarding and there is a plethora of information out there compared like these days compared to like when I went to university it was kind of only nomen but these days you've got so much good stuff on YouTube uh, and things like that so yeah sorry I'm, I'm not trying to make this like discouraging at all I just wanted to kind of um the practicalities of university um but yeah it's great and it taught me in those three years i kind of got to to a employable position but with a fair bit of hard work one other great thing about university is you will make connections um it's quite a difficult thing to do especially in the current time but um making connections is one of the most important things i think um i'll talk a little bit more about it kind of later later on but you're obviously connections uh, always sounds a bit wanky doesn't it when you're like oh I'm networking but it, it's kind of a thing but also friends for life as well like I have worked alongside people I went to university with I have lived like I flat shared in London with some people I went to uni with as well um, and it just makes that process a lot easier for example the other day I was learning Unreal and I had some questions and there were some people at my university that were studying games art so I could just fire them a message on um on Facebook rather than it's just because you kind of build up that network of people you've always got someone there when you're working on assignments to be like hey I'm struggling with this help me out kind of the same that I have at work um which you kind of don't get online when you're just watching a YouTube video or when you're um doing this and that um yeah so um I also uh, this is this is quite a personal one but I love learning new things um I really enjoyed um, you, I see, uh, this is another kind of complaint I see from uni students quite a lot. They're like, oh yeah, no, I really like the like 3D stuff, but they're making me read books or they're making me like do this and that. And I'm like, yeah, like I, um, so when I went to university, we had to do kind of a, um, there was one module every semester where you, um, had to write an essay about, so it was usually sort of to do with VFX, but it was about like George Melier, the, the creator kind of, of, um, of um, VFX on film um, and all these other bits and pieces. And those people would complain, but honestly, just the knowledge that is now given me that I didn't think I'd use. If you wanna be a 3D modeler, yeah, at uni, you're probably gonna to have to learn some rigging. You're probably gonna to have to learn a bit of animation. And I know at the time I, I absolutely hated the rigging modules. Like I really hated them, but honestly, just, just now because of that, I can talk to a rigger and I understand on a very basic level what they need, what they want. Um, at work at the moment, I'm working a lot inside a rigger and just knowing, knowing what a rigger needs when I submit a model to them or when I submit textures to them really helps me do my job better. So kind of um, take advantage of the learning. That's one of the great things about uni, especially in the, the first few years, you will do, you will learn a real broad range of skills and they might not seem applicable at the time, but honestly, later in life, that is really going to help you out. Um, so yeah. It's also, it's how I got my first job. So um, we, at the end of our three years, we made a, a short film that did quite well at the film day that you know, I went to. Um, and um, I got a job off the back of that. It wasn't the job that I wanted. Um, I was doing lighting and rendering at a small animation studio. 
Um, but slowly but surely, it was a step in the right direction. So let's talk about um, after university. So this is kind of the first few years. So yeah, like I said, my first job, it wasn't what I wanted, but it got my foot in the door. It was at a um, small company called Blue Zoo in central London, who I actually worked for the previous, I went back there recently as a modeler. Um, but yeah, I was a lighting and texturing, uh, sorry, no, a lighting and rendering artist, um, which was kind of like a render wrangler. It wasn't particularly fun, but I mean, I was getting paid to do what I'd done at uni for free. Um, it was something on my CV and I had some stuff for a showreel. After, I think it was after six months, they asked if I wanted to carry on and I took a bit of a leap of faith. I was like, no, this isn't for me. And I was like, I'm gonna leave. And I managed to get a job very, very quickly after that. Um, it was kind of luck, but it was also because I'd been working on my portfolio in the spare time, in my spare time. So I had a slightly better portfolio than when I graduated uni and I could take that around with some experience and kind of um, took me to NPC. So I worked at NPC as a groom artist for, it was, I think it was under two years. Uh, I worked on Jungle Book, I worked on Cinderella. So before I'd been kind of working on kids animation for TV and then I was working on these like crazy Hollywood block blockbusters. Um, but I was just a grooming artist. I wanted to be a modeling and texturing artist. And I took the role because groom at the time there, I think it still is, was in their asset department. So it was groom, modeling, texturing. I was like, well, I'm in the department. Hopefully I'll be able to move over. Um, I was not able to move over. They, uh, anyway, um, they, I, I kind of got pigeonholed a little bit as a groom artist um, just because it's quite a niche set of skills. So anytime they needed a model and texture, they were like, we'll just hire one externally because um, they didn't want to move me because I was good at grooming. So they were like, well, we'll never find another groomer because they're quite hard to come by. If you want a job in the VFX industry, be a groomer or be a rigger. They're like the two most stable things. Anyway, um, so yeah, I took another much larger leap of faith there after two years um, or just under two years, I left um, a really stable job at one of the best companies or one of the most working on some of the best films in, in the world. Um, I decided it wasn't for me. They, I realized I was never gonna get moved over. So I was just like, I'm out, um, left on good terms. And I've, I've worked there again since, but um, yeah, I took a leap of faith. and I was like, I'm gonna take some time off. I'm gonna up my showreel again. Um, and I'm gonna become a modeling and texturing artist. Um, or at the time, actually, I wanted to be just a modeling artist. Um, yeah, and then um, the, then, um, it was a strange one actually. I was out of work for a couple of months working on my stuff um, and uh, a company had just let go of loads of people. So I didn't bother applying there. I was applying to loads of other places. Uh, and then they randomly contacted me out of the blue. It was like a Friday night. I remember I was going to the pub in, in Soho to meet some friends and I just got an email on the tube. It was like, hey, do you want to come in for an interview? I was like, I thought they just fired loads of people. Um, but uh, yeah, that's how I, that's how I started working at DNEG. Uh, I had an interview there. I'd had an interview a year previously um, they'd kind of got me in, they were like, hey, do you want to come in, talk about a potential role? I was like, sure. Um, kind of expecting for the role to be then, but they were like, yeah, in the future. And turns out it was in the future and I, I managed to get a job there um, a year later. So that was kind of the job I wanted. They hired me as a generalist because at the time they weren't departmentalized. So because I've been out of work for two months, I was like, look, a generalist is a step in the right direction, even if it means I'm doing groom again. Um, but thankfully, um, when I got there, I remember talking to the recruiter, I was like, what am I gonna be doing? They're like, oh, you're probably gonna be grooming um, on Fantastic Beasts. So I was like, well, it's Fantastic Beasts, that's kind of cool. And then I got there day one. And the good thing was recruiters and um, production didn't seem to talk to each other. So I remember they were just like, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I can kind of model and texture. And I guess I can groom. And they were like, oh, cool, you're texturing. So that was my first time ever using Mari in the VFX industry. Um, and I worked on a digi double. I remember it was like um, some, crowd character in the back that you were never going to see. I textured that. They're like, oh, you can kind of, you can do this. All right. And then they gave me, um, if you've seen it, Credence, who's like the big bad in that, um, they gave me, they're like, oh, do you want to do his digi double? I was like, yeah, okay. And then I kind of impressed them with that. And then they got two creatures in the Obscurus, which was like this big particle thing and the Thunderbird. And because I'd impressed them with that, for some reason, they picked this, I think I was probably like 22, 23 at the time. They picked this 22 year old out of everyone there to texture this giant Thunderbird. And I just kind of got, it was the break. My, it kind of gave me this amazing piece of my show and it was um, an incredible break. Um, so yeah, I was at um, Dino London for I think about 12 months, Fantastic Beast wrapped. Um, and I was just having a bit of a bad time in London at the time. I remember I was living in a really crappy um, uh, shared house. Um, the people were lovely, but the house situation itself was bad. And I think the landlord was, maybe kicking us out to sell the house. 
Um, and I, I remember I'd been on like some really bad dates with someone and I was just a bit, I was having a bad time. So Fantastic Beasts had wrapped and I went and spoke to my artist manager on a Friday. Um, and I was like, oh, maybe, cause they had a Canada office. I was like, oh, I wouldn't mind going to Canada maybe like in a couple of years, like just checking that out. And she was like, they're, they're hiring now. Um, do you want to go now? And I was like, mm. she was like, take the weekend to think about it. And I'm the least spontaneous person you will ever meet. And I remember just thinking about it. I didn't even Google Canada. I should have done that. Didn't even look at Vancouver. Um, I just went back in on Monday. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll move to Canada. So um, I lived in Canada for nearly two years in, I was working at Dino Vancouver. It was a really great experience. It was kind of um, everything that London wasn't. Um, in the best and the worst ways. Uh, I got to go outside. I got to take these amazing Tinder pictures where I look very outdoorsy, even though I'm the least outdoorsy person you'll ever meet. It was great, um, but it was never home. Uh, I missed, like I said, Vancouver, Canada was kind of everything that London wasn't, best and the worst reasons. And my family wasn't there and all these other reasons. So after a couple of years, I knew that I wasn't gonna be there permanently. So I came back to England. Um, yeah, and then ended up going back there for another summer and then coming back. Basically, uh, that's another really great thing about VFX. Obviously, in in this was in the before times, but it is quite an international industry. Um, kind of these centers of VFX will pop up and kind of um, sometimes pop down. What's the opposite of popping up? They'll kind of appear and disappear sometimes as well um, around the world. So you do have the opportunity, opportunity to move abroad. Um, I think it's worth mentioning. I don't know the technicalities of this. So I'm going to say this with like um, a pinch of salt but um I think you need a university degree for that or at least it helps I remember them requesting my university degree now I'm not saying go to university so you can go and live in Canada but um it is a degree does also mean something kind of when it comes to visas and stuff like that there are definitely ways to get in without one but um I just thought that's something worth mentioning considering this talk is about going to university um so yeah, now and the future what does what does the future of VFX hold well if I knew the answer to that um they'd probably be, I don't know, paying me to, I don't know. anyway, um, no one knows. This is a this is a really strange industry, actually. Um, I kind of thought about this the other day. The, like I said, the first film to use VFX was 1982. So that's 40 years ago, 39 years ago. Um, that's not that old in the grand scheme of things. If you think about like the publishing industry, what that's been around hundreds of years. If you think about advertising, probably a hundred years. So in the grand scheme of things, VFX isn't that much of an old industry. And because of that, things shift quite dramatically because it's still kind of fine. It's in those like troublesome teenage years. It's still kind of finding its way. So since I've been working in it, things have shifted a lot. A lot of it has kind of gone abroad um, for kind of cheaper work. Um, so the kind of the golden age of VFX in Soho that, that a lot of the older people like to kind of talk about, which was like the Harry Potter films where there was loads of work in London, then it kind of all moved abroad. And like I was saying, it kind of, um, waxes and wanes a little bit so it, it does move around a little bit but it's still kind of finding its footing so the landscape now in versus the landscape two years ago or the landscape in in another two years is quite wildly different um i think uh that is just something to mention um if you like stability then vfx isn't necessarily the one to bring you that um and that's coming from somebody that loves stability at times it can be quite unnerving um but also your life will change as well um you might, I think this is something worth mentioning as well, something that people don't really talk about, but um, you might do VFX for three years and realize it's not for you. You might do VFX for 15 years and be like, oh, actually I'm gonna go and open that waffle house that I've always wanted to open, which is something I've always wanted to do. Um, but like there, I think your life will change. Um, and I remember a friend of mine left VFX about three years in to go and she went back to university to study psychology. And I remember at the time thinking, I was like, that's wild. You've studied all these years to like do this and then you're leaving. But no, like I think I'm um, looking back on it now. I think that was a really like, um, close-minded way to look at it. Um, just kind of embrace the change that life will bring at you. I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here, but basically um, your life will also change as well. For example, I've gone back to university, I'm studying part-time, um, I'm doing a writing course, writing and producing comedy, which is the worst thing to tell people you're doing, because they're like, tell us a joke, and I'm like, I'm not that kind of funny. Um, I like to write jokes on paper. Um, but yeah, I, so I've gone back, I'm studying something else just because as much as I love the effects, I also love some other things. So I'm trying some other things out as well. Um, yeah, and like I said, I've been learning Unreal Engine because one day I'd really like to make my own video game. Just kind of, I think um, it's just, I don't, know, I don't know what point I'm trying to make here, but uh, there's maybe a point in there somewhere. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, now in the future, Corona. Uh, 
Corona has changed this industry in ways I never thought would happen. I remember, um, so I actually lost my job um, two weeks before Corona got really bad in England. Uh, it, the, the company I was at downsized and they got rid of loads of us. Um, and I remember I had loads of interviews lined up and they were really good. The company I was at kind of were really good about it. They kind of got in, in contact with other uh, recruiters for us and they're like, hey, we're having to let go of these people or talk to them. So I had all these interviews lined up and one of them at my dream job and it went amazingly. And then the country just shut down and I never heard from them again. And I had six months off, which was kind of the best and the worst. Um, but I think it's just worth mentioning that the this industry has changed in ways that I never thought would happen. Usually clients um, uh, are like, this This information has to stay here, it can't go anywhere else. So when people were talking about remote work, I was like, well, it will never happen because Disney don't want this going out of the studio. That's, you have to sign so many blooming contracts. Um, it's never gonna happen. And then it had to because of just the realities of the world that we now live in. So um, I think it's just, it's another thing worth mentioning. Um, it's been an incredibly turbulent time. Um, you guys, uh, I mean, your lives will have been changed for presumably the worst because of it. I can't imagine anybody's been like, this has been the best 12 months of my life. Um, but on on the site, Silver Lining, you're, you, hadn't, you didn't have to graduate during that. Um, I can't imagine what looking for a job as somebody coming out of university during that time was. However, now that companies have kind of found their footing a bit more, they kind of know the remote way of working, they know how to onboard people. Um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be potentially there's gonna be bumps in the road, but the the world is kind of settling around this kind of new normal, as it were. Um, and I just think it's it's kind of worth mentioning that um everything's kind of been shaken up. Um yeah, I don't know. Again, I don't really have a point for this. I just feel like it's something worth mentioning. So I apologize. I do like to ramble. Um, yeah, so this is a slide uh, that I, um, I've talked to quite a few universities before, and this is one that I always like to include just because I think it's um, really important. Um, some things that you won't see talked about online, some things that um, people won't talk about. Um, and I kind of want to, these are life lessons I wish I'd known a little bit or life lessons that I've learned um, that I'm going to try and impart upon you guys. So first off, Everything I've said thus far, everything I will ever say is not necessarily true. It's it's what's worked for me. It's how I've got in the industry. But there will be a million and one ways to do things. Um, it's just I took a leap of faith and quit my job, and that worked for me. Whether you should, I can't say, and I wouldn't follow what I've been saying as rules of thumb by any means. Um, yeah. Also, I think um, this is me going off on another tangent, but I think it's just a really interesting thing. There's this thing called survivorship bias. I was having a talk with one of my VFX mates about this a little while ago, and he, he was really adamant against it. But I think there's something quite interesting about the people that are at the top of their game. They're like, oh, if you just work your ass off and if you just like um, struggle and if you just keep on working, keep on working, you will get there one day. Kind of ignoring the fact that I always find this funny with celebrities, more so than VFX, but Lady Gaga's up there like accepting award. And she's like, honestly, if you just do this every day and if you just eat ramen noodles and, and kind of sleep on the floor and, do all this stuff for nothing, you'll be famous one day. And it's like, no, that's not quite how it works. Um, that said, I think um, VFX is, is um, quite an interesting one because I think if you genuinely keep on practicing and keep on working on your portfolio and stuff like that, you will succeed one day. Um, I don't think anything is a given, but you can basically can raise your chances by doing loads of things. So by networking, by having, by learning all these new skills, like everything that you're doing towards that will kind of raise your chances about getting a job in VFX. I think it's also worth mentioning a lot of people I went to university with didn't get a job for a year or two years in VFX, but the ones that persevered eventually got there. A lot of people did fall by the wayside because after six months, they're like, you know what, this isn't for me. I need to start paying bills. That is just the reality of life. But then um, I think if you do keep at it, you will eventually get there with enough perseverance. Um, but again, that could be survivorship bias, which is just something that I wanted to bring up. Um, Jack of all trades, master of none. It's a phrase we've all heard. There is actually a bit of it that comes at the end of that, which people like to ignore, which is though oftentimes better than a master of one. A lot of people will have opinions on generalism. Again, this is just like a, the point above says, everything I say is not necessarily true. Um, so this is just what's worked for me. I've been a bit of a generalist my entire career. I know how to model, I know how to texture, I know how to look dev, I know how to groom, I know how to um, light somewhat, I can lay out ever so slightly, but rather than being the best hard surface modeler you will ever meet, 
um, I can do five things um, somewhat well. So it just means my employment perspectives have been a little bit higher. That said, I'm quite picky with what I do. I, I haven't accepted a groom role. I, I always get LinkedIn requests. They're like, hey, we need a groomer. I'm like, no, I don't do it. I don't enjoy it, so I don't do it. But that said, if stability is the one for you, then maybe learning a few new skills could kind of help you there. Um, yeah. Uh, I was about to say, I don't know if I should say this word on here, but I've probably sworn already because I've got an awful potty mouth. But um, my rule number one, which probably should have come before these, but don't be a dick. Literally rule number one when it comes to VFX, comes to life in general, but especially VFX. I don't know how big, uh, so you guys that are at uni now, I don't know how many of you there will be um, on your course, but I'm assuming uh, in my year, I think first year there was a hundred and then the second year it kind of dropped down to like 60 and then it kept dropping, dropping down. But that's a hundred people that you will know them in and out. And I have people that I went to uni with or people that I've worked with that I did not enjoy being in their presence because they were rude, because they were arrogant, because they lied, all these reasons, blah, blah, blah. Now, when you get into a job and all of a sudden you're being asked to recommend someone, you gonna you are gonna remember that. It's just it's 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 how it works. So if if somebody's like, hey, I've applied to your company, can you recommend me? If you're a dick, it's not gonna happen. So purely because this industry is so small, people talk, people know what people's reputations are. So just don't do it, even at university, because that stuff will stick with you. Um, yeah, there are still people that I went to university with that I if they apply to a company and they're like, hey, this person seems to know you, would you recommend them? I would just have to be like, no, I'd be like, I, they might have changed, but their behavior at the time was horrendous and I can't imagine them working well in the team now, blah, blah. Um, also just being a nice, on the other side of that, being a nice person will open so many doors for you. So when I got let go from um, DNEG just before Corona happened, um, there was a few of us kind of in the same boat. It was all the new hires. They kind of, they were like, ah, oh, we need to let go of some people. We're gonna to have to get rid of this lot. So me and this one guy became really good friends on the, like, it was literally the, the last two days, we kind of like bonded over the fact that we were both being let go. Um, and we, we stayed in contact afterwards and he recommended me for a job in, I was working on a Nike commercial in for a California, a Portland based um, client earning the most disgusting amount of money I've ever earned in a day. It was a, it was a really short project, but it was, and it was purely from a, from being nice to this guy, getting on really well, and just like making a friend. So um, being a dick with closed doors, being nice, well, it will make your friends, which is the more important thing. But in terms of like networking, it will open so many doors for you. The amount of jobs and stuff that I've been I've been offered just because, oh, so-and-so said this, uh, said good things about you, or we found your stuff on YouTube, like you seem okay, what are you doing? Um, just stuff like that, yeah. And make connections because they, in VFX, which is such a small industry, they will really, really pay off. Um, don't be hard on yourself. Um, I don't, I'm looking at my camera. I don't actually know if you can see me or if you can just see the um, PowerPoint actually. So I apologize if I'm just looking really yeah, intensely. Can see, yeah. oh, okay, cool, right. Um, <laughs> don't be hard on yourself. Being an adult is really, really tough. I remember when I got my first paycheck um, at, at, as a junior lighting and texturing artist and I studied for three years and I didn't quite have the job that I wanted, but it's fine because I was getting paid. And um, what I didn't realize at the time is the paycheck was only two weeks because I'd started um, halfway into a pay cycle. And I remember getting this like measly paycheck thinking this is all like, this is what my life is now. I'm doing five days a week to earn like 20 pounds a week or whatever it was. Um, I was just like phoning my mum up and bawling my eyes out. And the first, the first kind of six months out of uni for me, would, for me personally, they were just really tough because it was kind of like, realizing oh this is what the rest of my life is university was kind of fun and games it was living with your friends it was kind of all this social aspect and then I kind of you it's just it's just a really big life shift and I, I just took that really tough and I just kind of want to say um being an adult is really tough <laughs> especially like leaving university um going out into the wider world um it will be tough so don't be too hard on yourself don't beat yourself up because you haven't got that dream job um I didn't for four years and I worked my butt off and managed to get the, the job I wanted to. Um, so yeah, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, and at uni as well, don't be too hard on yourself at uni. Um, it's not the end of the world. Have three months savings when you can. This is probably one of the most, uh, when I say everything I say is not necessarily true, this one I would say is just really great life advice. So a good friend of mine, Josh Parks, always said this. I think he used to say three months. Maybe he said six months. Um, but have three months savings when you can, because um, especially looking back on the past year, 
without having some savings to fall back on, um, I wouldn't be able to afford the flat I was living in and all these things. So just kind of, um, obviously when you first get a job in the industry, you're not gonna be able to get three months savings overnight. It's gonna potentially take a while. And also maybe you're gonna be living in London, maybe you're gonna be living somewhere else. You kind of wanna enjoy yourself. But in terms of just general life advice, get some money saved up when you can. Like I said, the effects can be a volatile industry at times, but also the world is incredibly volatile at the moment, just in general. So um, yeah. Um, I think this is the one I'm gonna finish on, but potentially I feel like I've said this for every single one. Maybe this is the most important one. It is just a job. VFX is just a job. Um, it's cool to tell people that I worked on Jungle Book. It's cool to go to the cinema with somebody and see my name in the credits if they haven't missed it off. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it's a glorified desk job. Kind of, as I said earlier, in my kind of day-to-day, -day, I'm sat at a desk, I'm making incredible output. Like I'm doing really cool things versus like filling in an Excel spreadsheet, but it is just a job. And I feel like a lot of people, especially when you're a student, I was guilty of it myself. You kind of see these people that come in, give you talks like little old me, and you see there and you like potentially like, oh, this is gonna be amazing. This is gonna be the greatest thing ever. But it is just, it's a job. It's a way to make money at the end of the day. And you should never put your health or anything like that over it. Um, I've seen way too many people burn out in this industry. It can be quite challenging at times. You, sometimes there's late hours, but there's, I also, I feel like if you go online, especially like Reddit, the effects, people love to complain. They act, they're like, this is, blah, blah, blah. you have to take all that with a pinch of salt as well, because people are never going to go online and rave about when it's really good, are they? They're only going to ever leave a bad review. Also, like my brother, who's in the room next to me, he's, he's a graphic design artist. He does way more overtime than me for, than as a VFX artist. So it is quite, there is, definitely um, you need to put it into perspective a little bit but yeah it's just a job at the end of the day um don't ever put your own health over it um I've burned out a couple of times I've taken um time off the industry just because like I've worked on a really awful project or I've worked at a really awful company and I'm just like maybe this isn't for me and then I'll just kind of take a few months away regroup and be like do I enjoy 3D is this for me and then I'll work on a personal project and I'll realize I actually really love doing 3D but I just didn't enjoy doing it at this company or I didn't enjoy working on this project um and yeah, so don't push yourself too far. I've seen some of the most talented people, some people whose names you probably recognize online burn out. And it's really, it's incredibly sad um, because uh, they're just, when your job becomes your life um, and you kind of don't differentiate those a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that's when there's an issue. So have, have a life outside of the effects kind of is the thing that I want to finish on there. Um, and... Do you want to know more? This is the bit where I um, promote myself. So I've got an Instagram, which you can see on one of the sides, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I've got an Instagram there where I post some of my renders. But if you're interested in kind of learning some of the software bits, obviously um, university will teach you more than I will ever will in a few videos, but I've got stuff there. Maybe you're interested in VFX and you kind of want to see what it's about. You want to see the more software side of things, go on there, have a little taste to see if it's for you. Um, yeah, or maybe if you're already at uni, you might, um, learn a tip or trick. Um, I also have a Discord channel, which um, I don't have a handy link to just like be like, hey, do this. It's like a really weird URL. But if you go on any, uh, most of the YouTube videos, if you go into the descriptions, there will be links to all my socials. And on that, I kind of give feedback on people's work. Um, I haven't the last few weeks because I've just been incredibly busy, but usually I, I will give quite detailed feedback on people's work. And just because I kind of want to see um, the level kind of of online discourse around 3D kind of the standard kind of raise because like I said there's a lot of really bad tutorials out there and um, and that kind of was perfectly um an hour which I'm glad uh and so this is the part of the thing where you can ask any questions there are no stupid questions and I will answer as candidly as I possibly can I think um that's sometimes a bit what's missing people don't talk honestly about this sort of stuff because there is there's there can be weird egos in 3D and VFX and people are like this is I'm a god because I made this it's like no sit down um so yeah cool yeah thanks for that I, was, I really like the honest kind of um, as you said honest look at it when you don't normally necessarily get that at uni when people are just saying everything's going to be amazing <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not always I, necessarily the case absolutely not and I think it's it can be really quite detrimental to people just because yeah I've seen people I've seen some of the most talented artists burn out and like just be like shells at their desk because I think they bought into a dream that isn't like it's a yeah anyway cool yeah so I think we've got a couple of questions Hello, I'm here now too hello Hi, everybody I hope you're enjoying all the talks so far um thanks Michael that was so good 
Um, I love how candidly you talk about everything and I want you to do it more and more and more. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Until I can never get a job again in the industry. <laughs> no, I just find it so interesting because we had this chat the other week about those kind of gods who do all these big things and they have that kind of presence, whereas you're totally in the best way, norm normal. I hate that word, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, yeah. But also um, I think I, I'm very aware that my level of work is not the best. I think, um, <laughs> no, I like, I, there are, there are so many people better online at VFX than me. Um, it's just kind of like, I'm always willing to learn new things yeah. and I, I, I always want to improve my work because I know it could be better. Um, but that's another reason why you're not one of these godly figures because you're always going to say that even if you were <laughs> um so i've got a few questions from some students mm. um so first one is did you find yourself feeling fully qualified after uni because one of this person's main worries is that um after being at uni they're worried they won't be like ready for their oh project. absolutely not um I, I should, I'm going to bring her up, but Michelle Obama, um, she talks about, in a, I haven't read her book, I'm going to pretend I re read her book, but um, she, in her book, she talks about how she feel, felt like an imposter at the White House. Now, if Michelle Obama can, has imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't feel bad if you do. Like I, all, I think it was probably only about, when did I start doing the YouTube videos? It was, it was probably about a year and a half ago, two years ago. I was like, oh, I'm actually not crap at this. Like I, I know what I'm talking about um probably should have no actually it was just before I started doing the YouTube videos because I was like I don't want to do these and then um I was working with the foundry and, and then I did some for them and I was like oh no I kind of know what I'm talking about like I can teach this for other people um but yeah still on a daily basis at work they'll give me a task and I'll just be like I don't know how am I supposed to do that um so yeah I think um I think if you did feel qualified when you left uni to like I think that would be worse than feeling I yeah I absolutely didn't like you can't learn everything to do with VFX in three years um and you also I learn new things on a daily basis if I didn't I I probably wouldn't be doing this job anymore because that's one of my favorite things is learning new stuff but yeah you're always going to be learning great thank you um so with Unreal Engine becoming more prominent within the industry um what other areas do you think Unreal Engine would potentially be adopted in or potentially change do you think it could potentially change, combine the roles of an environment designer and layout artist? That's a very good question. Um, so I can't speak on it too much. I know at, um, purely because I'm not, I'm not like in environments. So I don't be like, absolutely, because I don't quite have the um, credentials to say 100% one way or another. I remember when I was at DNEG, they were using it in the environment department, I seem to remember. And they were just like blocking, they were like mountain here, mountain here, and it was just like dragging and dropping. So in a way that's kind of layout, but I don't think it was layout for like the characters in the foreground. I think it was a lot of like the wider kind of environment stuff. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a really, really interesting one. I think it, um, it will be, it'll be great if it does because it's so quick. Um, I mean, like Wet is using it. Like I think Mandalorian was using it for all their background were they doing I don't know if it was unreal or if they would do no it was unreal wasn't it they were using it with their virtual production stuff um that said I feel like everybody online is like this is how every tv show is gonna be made it's like no that costs millions so of course Disney could afford it but not every like Riverdale isn't going to be able to afford that um so yeah uh I think it's going to change the way the industry operates for sure but it hasn't at the moment like it hasn't fundamentally shaken up the effects yet uh, whether it will it has it has changed a lot of pre-production um i remember i um i had to help out doing some really basic unreal stuff um for a pre-production film that i don't think has been announced um they were kind of uh laying everything out in pre-prod in unreal before getting it onto set so the director could kind of see what this fight sequence is going to look like or whatever it was um yeah so I, I, it is kind of creeping its way in but um yeah sorry i don't know if that's that good you did answer yeah you were like yeah but maybe not yet. Slowly. <laughs> Slowly, yeah. Things take time and it costs money. Um, mm. Cool. So um, somebody asks, would specialising in something specific be better than having multiple common skills? So I guess that's like the generalist kind of question. Yeah, and it's such a, it's, um, it's a really tough one because you you could ask three VFX artists and they'd say yes or no. I think with, with certain things, like for example, if you want to be a compositor, you are never, because that's 2D versus 3D, um, you're never going to need to know how to groom hair. You're never going to need to know how to really texture clothing. It might be great for you if you want to create a showreel where you film, model, comp it. Yeah. 
Um, so there definitely is something to say about specializing. Also, when you're applying for a job, nine times out of 10, some, you will often see like generalist role. We're looking for a 3D generalist. That's usually at smaller studios rather than larger houses because larger houses, they have departments. Um, but you will need to submit a role, a reel for texturing, or you'll need to submit a reel for look dev. So um, I think you need to create a reel kind of that is specialized in a way, but I think learning things around the periphery of that skill set. So if you're a compo, you don't need to really know 3D stuff, but if you're a 3D star, 3D artist, you probably don't need to learn Nuke super in depth, kind of as it were. So there definitely is like limits to generalism. Like my generalist skills are very much in kind of the wheelhouse of modeling, texturing, look dev, groom, um, lighting to an extent. Um, but I couldn't tell you, I don't know how to animate, I don't know how to rig. Um, Would you say it was different going if you were applying for like feature films compared to things like commercials? Yeah, so commercials often will be like, we need a general, like commercials is very much like, and that's usually because you're working with like three people. Um, I remember when I, I worked on this um, Adidas and Alexander Wang campaign, and I was just texturing the clothes and all the other guys, they were like working with C4D, it was a nightmare. They didn't know what a UDIM was, like, it was one of the worst things I've ever done. Um, but they, um, they were doing like everything and I was just handing them the textures. And I think that was really quite rare actually. Um, it was just because I saw a shout on a shout out on Instagram. They're like, we're looking for people to do this. So I just applied and they're like, oh, you can texture really well for this specific thing because we need the garments in really high quality. Um, we'll get you. But generally with ads, yeah, it's definitely a lot more specialized. Um, sorry, generalized, generalized. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Uh, someone's asked, what was your favorite project to work on? Mm. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so my favorite, and I think this goes kind of for working in general, my favorite times at work have always been the people I'm working with, not the project I've been on. Like Detective Pikachu was on paper, the coolest thing for me personally, because I, I love Pokemon. Um, it's the coolest thing on paper that I would see, like 18 year old of me would have seen and been like, oh yes, you've, you've made it. That was probably the worst project I've ever worked on purely because of the environment where I was like, because of what was going on at that time. That said, some of the worst projects I've worked on, I'm trying to think. Um, Thunderbird on, I'm actually, I'm gonna say the Thunderbird on Fantastic Beasts. So I was at, at DNEG London and there was like six of us were in the corner of this room and I was texturing. We had like people, one, we had the rigger, we had the look dev, we had the groomer and we were all just like in this little corner. Um, and it was like the first time as well when I was at DNEG London that I'd kind of like come out my shell a bit and I was like making friends with them and we just come in every day and every day it was like so much banter. Um, but it was also, it was a hectic project. Like it was really, there were times in that show where I was like, ah, what am I doing with my life? But just having those people around me. Um, and I think that goes for a lot of like work environments. It's who you work with rather than what you work on. Um, and I found, yeah, yeah, no, sorry. No, I was going to say that's what quite a lot of people say. I think like we've had quite a few VFX artists come in this year. Um, last when what month is it? I don't even know when. No one knows in. anymore. But you know, it's probably March. Is it March? It is March. It but anyway, is, yeah. Sorry, long story short. <laughs> um, but yeah, loads of people are saying it's all about the people in VFX, and it does mm. sound hugely that that's the case. And you can have like the best film, the best jobs to do, but be around people who aren't fun, and that is a life thing anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you're at a job for eight hours a day. You kind of wanna. And it's, it's an interesting one as well, like remote working has kind of changed that dynamic. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see like how much people want to get into an office when it, yeah. the world kind of opens up again. Well. Have you heard any news about like now the vaccine's coming and things are going better? Have you had any kind of word from work? No, so I, um, I, I didn't say what I'm doing at the moment actually. Oh, so I'm actually, yeah. it's quite, it's a funny one. I'm working for a Japanese company from England ah, um, for a Californian based client. <laughs> oh. Um, and most of our team is in Europe. It's this, it's this whole thing. Um, ah. So yeah, I um, unless unless they move me over to Tokyo, I'm going to be in yeah. an office uh, okay. in my home office uh, for the foreseeable future. So what are you working um, on? Can you tell us? I'm I th I'm just gonna let me quickly Google if it's been announced. I'm almost certain it has. I just I'm really <laughs> wary with this stuff just because I've seen Don't worry. people say the wrong thing. I always ask the wrong thing. So um... do you like working from home? Um. I, I'm very mixed on it. Uh, sorry, I'm just checking. Bear in it's... mind that he moved out of his flat to live with his parents. So <laughs> I guess if you knew you were going to live at home, for, like work from home for ages, you probably wouldn't want to be there, would you? Yeah, um, it's been it's been really interesting. On on one hand, I absolutely love it because I don't have to commute in London, which yeah. is great. Um, it also, if you've had a few too many whiskeys the night before, it makes running out of Handy. bed a lot easier. Yeah. Um, 
and um it just means you can kind of generally just sort of switch off and be like right step away from mm -hmm. your computer um so yeah that's really great i really miss the social aspects um yeah which i didn't at the beginning kind of round one lockdown round two because i was with my flatmate um and we were and then obviously the world opened up a bit more um but yeah i think i my ideal situation would be kind of two days in three days out or three days in yeah. two days out um i yeah so i think it has been announced it's um it's a project called oni for um uh tonko house but i'm working at a company called megalus so I've, I've just checked it's on google so it's fine i can talk about i it. thought they might ask some questions about that if they knew <laughs> what film you were on um brilliant thank you um another question then so when you're working in bigger vfx houses how comfortable do you feel pointing out possible problems or better ways of doing something usually actually i would say at bigger houses that's not an issue because it's already they're well aware of it um pipeline is often one of the things that can um trip people up um when i've worked at smaller places it's actually the thing you're just kind of sat there and you're like oh why aren't you doing this properly um and unless you have real sway in that company um you're not really going to change their mind or unless they've made you permanent or you're like a supervisor there and you're like hey guys this is kind of how we're doing it um it, it's not going to happen so um yeah bigger houses usually it's not the issue um and also the good thing about bigger houses is because that pipeline is very strict um, if you're if you're going to a DNA or if you're going to an ILM, I'd assume I've never worked at ILM, but like one of those big companies, they will have training documents. They'll be like, this is how we do things. Here's your mentor. They're going to teach you through stuff. Whereas maybe the smaller companies, it's a, it's a bit more free form. So you're, the training might not be quite as um, quite to the same level. Um, so usually it can be really daunting to start at a big company, but they're well aware of like how to kind of ingest a junior and they're like, um, ingest is such an awful word, onboard a junior. <laughs> um so usually that kind, there's a really good structure in in place for a week or two you'll have a training project anyway before you're kind of thrown onto the big stuff so yeah this is um uh, this might not make sense but do you think there'd be a difference if you went from university straight into somewhere like DNEG or ilm where you learn the very specific strict workflow compared to if you went to blue zoo where you kind of almost kind of do your own thing um, like if you left there mm. you, you're more adaptable if you... i think um <sighs> It's an interesting question, actually. Um, I think you're going to be better off if you were at a bigger house, purely because um, and it, there is a right in a way, there is a right and a wrong way to do things. Um, and usually the reason bigger houses are doing the things the way they're doing it is because they need to render out a million shots with disgusting render times by next week. So they know they have to be the most efficient. So your UDIMs, everything is named correctly. Everything is textured to the res it needs to be textured. There's no rig weirdness. There's no like, there's no like, your file isn't named incorrectly. You'll have a tool that publishes everything for you or it will like check everything for you because they know they can't get that. They can't let errors get into the pipeline. Whereas when you're, you're at a smaller studio, you usually don't have that backbone behind you to be like, hey, I've checked your file and this was named incorrectly. So that might get through to all the way to the comp and then they're like, oh, why is this balking up? And it's like, oh, well. So I do think um, generally, and this isn't to say anything about Blue Zoo because I've, I've previously worked there um, uh, just because you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but generally at smaller studios, that backbone isn't quite as tight. Actually, Blue Zoo had a really good pipeline when I went back recently. Um, but yeah, that that um, that backbone isn't quite as tight. So um, yeah, I would like to. I'd say if you go from bigger to smaller, you're generally better off. I don't know. I don't know. Cool. Yeah. No. So actually, it's opposite of what I kind of expected, really. Because I thought you, if you learn something specific, you get somewhere else, and you might go, "Where's the button that does this?" Or where's the pipeline tool that does this? And then you're like, oh no, we do that manually. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's actually quite. A good, that is a really good point because often you have in-house tools, but. Um, often because of the bigger houses like you will be working on these crazy assets like it, the detective pikachu asset i worked on was 70 were they 16k no eight 78 k udems that had to go between substance and then mari and i like i had to think on my feet so much where i was just like uh this program can't handle this much data so how do i do it and because you're working on such massive like technical um problems when you go to a smaller company that's kind of working on like a much smaller scale, you're like, well, I've got all this knowledge that I've used before and you can kind of just pick and choose at that. Um, yeah. So I do think they kind of set you up as well, a bit better in terms of mindset. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Um, one last question, and then Ooh. I know we're going to, um, after this, guys, Michael's going to talk um, a bit more kind of specifically about your process of, um, well, I don't even know. How do you explain it? What, what are you going to talk about, Michael? What are you I don't doing? know. <laughs> My creative process, which is just yeah. the worst thing to your creative hate process. So uh, after this question, um, if you if you're not very VFX tech like savvy and and you just kind of wanted a bit of an overview, you might not want to stick for the second half if that makes sense. Um, but also you're welcome to stay. But I'll ask this question, and then if you you are we I asked Michael to kind of do this more for the HE VFX students, but like I said. All is welcome. Yeah, Visual I would say as well, it's, it's not going to be super technical. It's going to be more about kind of the process. So I think you will get something out of it regardless. Yeah. That said, it is going to be kind of like, um, I will be saying nomenclature like UDIMs and stuff like that. Yeah. And I'm what not is a explain. UDIM? I won't ask that now. I won't ask that. I'm like, is a UDIM like a pixel? No, probably not. Okay. So, um, Soz, do you have any advice on getting out of a perfectionist mindset and believing work you do isn't good enough or any advice on how, how you do that? Um, oh, that's a really good question. I'm gonna, this is, this is an answer I probably shouldn't give a, like a professional um, event thing, but like, I'm gonna say I'm quite lazy. <laughs> like I, I just want things done as soon as possible. Like if it, if it looks to a good enough standard, I'm like, right, on to the next thing. Um, so in terms of perfectionism, I don't know. I was definitely more that way at uni. I was like this, I remember again, uh, second time I said this, phoning my mum, like crying down the phone, just being like, <laughs> And I, I'm going to say it because it's relatable, like maybe some of you guys will have felt the same and you don't hear people often talk about this. But I remember our first thing at university, they were like, right, make a pod racer. We had to make, it was like our first like 3D thing. And I'd never properly modeled in 3D. And like all these people around me, they were like making these amazing things that could have been in Star Wars. And I was just like doing a cylinder. I was just like, ah. And I had this idea. I wanted this pod racer that was like covered in snow because it had like crashed on this icy planet. And I remember just being like, I wanted to get here but my, my technical abilities could only get, like, I wanted to get here, but I could only get here. I remember phoning my mum, just like distraught. I was like, I'm no good at this. I'm never going to achieve anything. <laughs> um, and um, I think you, it's that kind of thing. It's like kind of going back to, you just have to give yourself a break at a point because like, you're not doing yourself any good. Like every, pro every new project that you're going to do is, is going to improve on the skills that you've last learned. So sometimes you may want to sit there for another two weeks kind of finessing a project, but the kind of the last, I always say the last 10% of a project always takes 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. And the first 90% takes 10% of the time because you're kind of just fiddling with details. And at some point you've kind of just got to be like, look, this isn't, this is, is not going to help me spending this extra time. Like I'm going to learn more if I jump onto the next one. So after a while, you've kind of just got to wash your hands of it. I know that's, that doesn't really answer the question about perfectionism. It's probably more realistic in the industry though, isn't it? I think you when have deadlines, I've you got the same thing. Them. Yeah. With my students, I know so many of them are like, Don't, it's not ready. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's sometimes the process. And I think at college and uni, you can try and be a perfectionist a bit more, but in the industry, you, you probably just have to meet your deadline and that's, hand it it's, in. And it's such a good point. Cause realistically, like when you're being paid to do this, like they don't care that you could get this looking better in another week they're yeah. like well it needs to render tomorrow yeah. so you just have to get it out so and um, there's a really good term that um i've heard used online they use it a lot with screenwriting but um kill your babies which is quite an aggressive thing but after a while yeah slightly <laughs> if you, you haven't heard this okay so basically after a while you just like you've got to set free the thing you love you just kind of have to be like it's oh, okay. done like let it go or like when you've got a really amazing idea and you're just holding on to it for too long even though it's not gonna be very good you just okay. kind of got a it's not good kill your babies um <laughs> our, our lecturer used to use he used to <laughs> shout at us he'd be like kill your babies kill your babies I'm like whoa calm down yes we just think of something that's not quite illegal maybe like i don't know like <laughs> kill your loved one no not loved ones kill, oh, kill your kill jake <laughs> wow um, that kind of thing. <laughs> um cool that's all the questions then that i've got um so should we pass back over to michael to kind of tell us through his creative process and like I said for those of you who just wanted to listen to kind of the introduction and you're, you've had had enough of Michael today yeah I've joking, talked Michael, I, no, I've talk, my, I'm sure they love you um I'm not going to do any more Q&A's either so if you've got any comments or anything like that we might be able to look through those instead so yeah we'll head back to Michael if that's all right guys okay cool, cool. um do 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 can you see my screen yes. we can okay sick cool so this is me part two creating imaginary asset um, it's going to be a very brief overview, so um, I'm not going to go too much into detail. Um, and some of this I've covered on my YouTube or Gumroad as well. So um, 
I kind of um, just wanted to go over the overview of creating some of these things that I've already shown you. So we've got Greg here, we've got um, Squirtle, and we've got Trixie Mattel. Um, I'm going to go over Squirtle because I recorded a lot of the process of that. So I kind of have videos that I can show in the background as I'm kind of talking about the process. Um, I'm also going to touch on Greg, who's this is the last project that I finished. Um, I'm also going to say up front, I don't think these are the best things that have ever been made. They're absolutely not. Um, I there's a lot better 3D people out there. So I'm not being, I don't want to be like, hey, this is how you make amazing 3D because I don't, I'm, I learn along these projects and that's why I kind of like making new things. Like I learn, pick up new tricks. Like this was the first digital human I've done in a while. Granted, it's a kind of creepy face, but um, so I, I learned quite a lot along the way and I'm just going to kind of pass the knowledge on that. I'm also not a great designer. Um, these, this was quite interesting because, um, and this is what I'm going to talk about. I haven't got pure ref open, sorry, one sec. Um, this is something that I'm going to talk about um, as well, kind of interpreting a, a 2D concept. Um, so let me just, I'm just going to make sure my notes are open on my other screen, what I'm going to talk about. Cool. So um, if you have ever, I know a couple of you in the chat might have visited my Discord um, where I kind of give feedback on work and um, post my videos and stuff like that. But if you've ever kind of um, been on there, you will know my hard and fast rule number one is reference is king. Like reference is the base of everything that we do in VFX. So if you want to make a Squirtle, if you want to make Greg from Over the Garden Wall, if you want to make tricks them out you're going to need some good reference of those things so what i'm actually going to do is i'm going to go on art station now and i'm going to find a random image and um i'm just going to break down how i would um oh my avg is running out how i would kind of approach that um a lot of people will be like yeah but it's fantasy so it shouldn't look like a real life thing and to that i say sure but not in my process um, so I'm, I'm keeping this off stream just because I know how ArtStation likes to be like, you will get a lot of nudity on there if you're not careful. So I'm just going to find something. Um, I had a good one yesterday and I don't know why I didn't keep that open. Um, but so basically, let's just talk about Squirtle quickly. You know Pokemon, um, I hope. If you don't, then wow, I'm really showing my age. But so this was the image that made me want to make Squirtle here. I was like, oh, I love Squirtle Squad. I think it's one of the greatest episodes of TV. Um, it's just fantastic. So I was like, oh, I wouldn't mind making a 3D Squirtle. That would be kind of fun. So I started collecting reference of Squirtle. And um, so he's very 2D, he's very flat looking, but I knew I wanted to make kind of a more realistic version. Um, so obviously we've got the Detective Pikachu one here, which, I mean, people like to say that my stuff looks kind of ungodly. This really creeps me out because the arms look like like fatty baby arms. I don't like it. I really don't like it. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I was like, right, how I kind of wanted to go in between like a snapping turtle and a real life turtle. Uh, and sorry, and, a, and Squirtle in the Pokemon thing. So to do that, I knew I needed to get reference. So I was like looking at this and I was like, right, what do I need reference of? Well, I'm going to need reference of the show. I'm going to need reference of turtle skin. I'm going to need reference of eyes, whether that's any sort of reptilian eye. It doesn't necessarily have to be a turtle one. Um, I'm going to need reference of um, sunglasses. Um, trying to think what else I did. So I spent a while on Google, quite a long time on Google, um, and I collected really good reference. Um, one handy tip, this is such a, I don't know if I'm preaching to the choir here, but let's just type in car on Google. So if you go to Google Images, especially if you're looking for texture reference, always just go to, they, they hide it away now, I always forget where it is, tools and just do size to large. Because there's nothing worse than get, finding a really good image and then it actually is like 200 pixels by 200 pixels. Um, but so find good reference for this guy because I knew I was gonna be modeling and texturing it. I wanted to find reference for not only the shape but also the texture and also how the shader responds to light. So look dev, texturing and modeling reference. So that's kind of what I did. I started finding images for turtles that I liked that I didn't know what direction I was gonna go in to begin with. So I found all down here, you can see, I think these are tortoise, maybe these are turtles. I forget the difference between tortoise and turtle. So these were all one kind of turtle down here. I've got ones for, this is my undershell reference. Here you can see I've got really good ones for kind of the patination, the sculpt detail that I want. Um, and I've got a lot so that I can kind of steal aspects from other parts. Now you might be sat there and be like, well, it's a Pokemon, Michael. It doesn't have to be set in real life. And no, it absolutely doesn't. Like I don't have to follow this one for one. I mean, I didn't. Um, but I think 
if you, and this is absolutely a personal opinion, so um, take it with a pinch of salt, you might absolutely disagree. And if you do, more power to you. But I think one of the, um, if you think about like films that you've watched, if you ever think about like a weird alien, like the reason E.T. kind of works is because he's fairly humanoid. Like he's got, he's got features that you can kind of be like, oh, he sort of looks human. He's like not that uncanny. Whereas um, I think it was, what was that film with that Spielberg did? Uh, Super 8. Was it Super 8? The alien and that, like it was just kind of unfathomable. You didn't really know what you're looking at. So there was like the, I don't know, uh, to me, it was just quite an unsatisfying design. So when I'm working on something, I always like to kind of take bits, even if it's a fairly unrealistic thing, I like to steal bits from real life, just so that there's that frame of reference. So that when your eyes looking at it, you're like, oh, that kind of looks, yeah, no, I know what I'm looking at. Um, again, personal opinion, I'm, I'm not particularly design oriented, but so I've got reference here for the skin, especially like the crevice and the dirt inside of there. Um, this one I was using all the time to just see kind of how moss builds up. I don't think I, I use it a little bit around the beak. So you can kind of see here has sort of inspired here. Uh, what else have we got? Um, those are some early renders tests. Uh, this one was super, super helpful for beak detail. Um, kind of looking at the shape that it goes. Um, where's the one? There's one where it's like, yeah, this, it looks like a gnarly toenail, but like getting all this sort of chipping detail, um, I was able to kind of just have this off screen and refer to this and be like, all oh, right, let's get a crack in here. Let's get this in there. So let's, I'm just going to quickly look for a 2D. I should probably filter it to 2D on ArtStation. And I just break down, right, if this was a concept that I wanted to make for my portfolio, then what would I start looking at? Um, oh, that's quite a challenging one. Maybe I'll go with that. Um, Yeah, cool. So we're going to go with this. And the, I've picked a really obscure one. So I've kind of given myself a bit of a headache here because I feel like with these, especially with Squirtle, it's basically a turtle that happens to be blue. Greg from Over the Garden Wall, it's a kid that's just kind of a little bit, the, the features are kind of shaped to the character from the show. And Trixie Mattel is basically just a doll because she really likes dolls. So they're not exactly groundbreaking in terms of like, yeah, you can kind of tell there's something from real life. But if I were to make this, for example, and I wanted to make it realistic, can I full screen that? I can. So this is kind of, a lot of people will be like, well, what about super fantasy things? So this is, again, just my personal opinion if I were to approach this. But I would just find things that I can kind of reference in real world and start using them for reference. Again, you don't have to follow that reference one-to-one. -one, but if you were, especially with 2D drawings, if you're looking at a 2D drawing and you don't know how to interpret something, you falling back on real world reference is one of the most useful things because you can be like, oh, um, like I had somebody in the Discord the other day, they were, they were making something and they were like, oh, I don't know which way the wood on this should go. And if you have a picture of what you're making, they were making a real world asset in that example. And at that point, it's like, well, you literally just have to refer to your reference. Like, but with, with things that are a bit more interpretive, like what's this? you could kind of be like, well, this to me, I look at this, I'm like, is it a stag beetle's kind of leg or is it, what is it? So I would just go stag beetle leg. I'm doing it off screen in case it comes up with some, like it's some weird thing that I've, like some sex term I've never heard of. Um, so this would be, I'd start using this and this would, it gives me form. It gives me slightly more form than this. So I can see there's sort of like, again, this is why you go with large thing. I can see there's like this really nice shading detail. It almost looks a bit like a strawberry. It's got these dimples. Um, I've got these nice kind of ombre gradients, but you can also see that the spec is a little bit broken up. So it's not completely smooth. This one is completely smooth. You could do that, but when you start translating that to 3D, it might look a little bit simple. Um, maybe that's the style you're going for. Absolutely, more power to you. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how I would start. I would build a really good visual library of reference inside of Pure F. If you haven't had a Pure F, then it's, um, it's basically, I only started using it really recently. It's just this program and it houses all your images. You save that one file and it keeps all those images inside of one. And then that way you don't have to flick between hundred images just inside of Windows Image Viewer. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the first and arguably the most important part of doing a 3D real piece. Um, you will be presumably doing it for a showreel. You potentially, maybe you, you will have painted something yourself that you want to turn into 3D. But often I know when I was at uni, I would just find these really cool concepts online. I'd be like, oh, I really want to make that in 3D. That's going to be my next showreel piece. So yeah, I would just break it down and be like, right, cool. What's this material? What's this material? What's the modeling of this supposed to be like? Because 2D paintings, this one, not so much, but often they're just so interpretive. 
um, really, really painterly, and you just kind of have to read between the lines a little bit. And often falling back on real world reference is going to give you much more realistic and better looking stuff. Obviously, this is coming from a VFX artist, so I work in kind of realism and realistic sort of stuff, but yeah. Um, and again, and um, actually some of the stuff I'm working on at the moment is a bit more stylized. So I will be taking, we will still, use, we will always use real world ref. It's always like, right, where's the real world ref? But the world that that stuff lives in has a style. So we will kind of imbue that style upon it. So we'll be like, right, that's great, but let's scale it up a bit more. Or um, that looks cool, but let's kind of exaggerate the silhouette of it a bit. But the, the um, actual surface level detail is incredibly realistic. Um, again, that's the style of the sh of like whatever. Um, yeah. So um, kind of when I've done that, um, it would be time for a block out. So we're going to, again, I'm just going to run through my process of making this square tool. Um, so let me do, 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 do. I'm going to just load this up. And um, so I'm just going to kind of talk over these videos. Um, this is me, the ZBrush block out of um, this square tool. So originally when I first started this project, actually I was like, I'm going to do a heavily stylized one. And you can see kind of, I get to the end of it and just looks a bit crap. Also, I think it's worth mentioning this looked crap for a very long time. Um, it did not look good. And I was like, is it even worth pursuing this? Like, uh, what if this is a really bad portfolio piece? But I learned so much along the way. And by the end, I kind of like pulled it together. So often it's that whole like 90, 10% thing. Like it, it takes a long time, but it's that last 10% that often will kind of bring bring stuff together. So yeah, I was just blocking out inside of ZBrush. And then I got halfway through and I was like, um, no, actually let's go for something slightly more realistic. So off screen, I've literally got, I can show you, where's the, the ugly guy himself, these little, this one I'm using and this one as well. And I'm just using that form to kind of inspire me a little bit. I moved away from it a lot towards the end, but this is the great thing about ZBrush is it's like, I was using Dynamesh. So it's incredibly free form and I could just kind of move and shape things. Um, so yeah, kind of got to, to this sort of point, which is much closer to the, the final thing. You can see I curved out the head by the end because I wanted to keep that feature of Squirtle. A lot of this was me sort of pushing and pulling, like how realistic, how much of Squirtle do I kind of want to get in there? Um, and yeah, sorry, I'm just going to get my notes back up. The So I should mention that for hard surface, this probably isn't the approach you're going to take. If you're doing hard surface, you're just going to stay in my realistically. Maybe you'll unless you're, a, I, I don't know many people, but like maybe you're amazing at ZBrush hard surface, um, which if you are, fair play to you, because I am not. But with that stuff, I would have the concept just in Maya and I'd kind of be like either modeling alongside it or if it's like a, a nice orthographic thing, you could literally model over it. Um, but yeah, for, for more organic things, I'm usually inside a ZBrush just to kind of quickly block something out. Um, again, if you really wanted to, you could do that inside of Maya. But um, yeah, so when that's kind of all done, let's see where we get to at the end. So I kind of had my shape in there. It's moving incredibly fast. Um, and that's when I, so I was like, right, this, these are the final forms that I kind of want to get into texturing. I want to get into um, Mari specifically for this. Um, so I need to retopologize it. So when you've kind of got your block out, you need to start thinking about retopology. Um, because you don't want to be texturing a million poly mesh, you could use, um, ZBrush paint, I, can't, I literally can't remember what it's called. You could paint inside of ZBrush and export that later on, but you're still gonna have to re it. You're still gonna have to get UVs. You can see me here um, at the time I was testing out ZBrusher inside of um, ZBrush because this is I was doing this on Twitch just for fun. And then the project became a lot bigger, like the scale slowly grew and grew. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna re this by hand properly. So just did that inside of Maya. Let's um, get that up. Ooh. Doo, doo, doo. So really easy. The retopology tools inside of Maya are great. You're literally just drawing a cube. Always stay as low poly as you can until the end. Don't start adding loops. I actually didn't on this. I thought I've got all these extra loops up here, which I shouldn't have done. Like just get a block form and then start looping up. Just make sure your kind of edge flow works. Um, yeah, and when that's done, you can also start UVing it. Um, so you can, you can see here I, when I got that shape roughly in, um, just start putting things into UDIM, start laying out kind of like getting my finalized low poly mesh, getting my finalized UVs and um, ready to pop back into ZBrush and then get into Mari. Um, the good thing about this sort of stuff is it doesn't have to be 100% finalized. Like the great thing about ZBrush is, I mean, it's a nightmare project, but if I need to quickly change the UVs because 
the textual density was slightly incorrect or this edge wasn't um, unfolded enough, then what I can do is just quickly do that inside of Maya, reload it back in as the lowest subdivision, and then I just have to rebake out everything. It's a little bit like, it's a bit frustrating when you have to like, you're like, I have to take this back through ZBrush and I have to take it back through Mari and I have to blah, blah, blah. But in theory, if you're doing it correctly, you're never actually gonna lose data because it will hopefully just transfer correctly. You don't have to project anything. It will just update it. Um, so yeah, it's always, it's good to think about UVs upfront, think about UDIM placement, think about especially textile density, get a UV checker on your UVs, make sure that everything is correct. Um, yeah, but it's not the end of the world. I know the low poly for this changed quite a bit. The eye, I feel like the eye size changed at one point, like the eye socket. Um, yeah, but when that's done, then um, I could start detailing it in ZBrush. So this was, this was kind of a interesting project. Um, and let me tell you why. So there's this thing you may or may not have heard of it. Um, if you're in the college side of things, you won't, but um, there's um, this amazing website called Texturing XYZ. So these are often the textures that people use in industry. If you're doing a digi double and stuff like that um, for skin textures, because texturing a skin is incredibly, um, texturing a face is incredibly hard. And um, often if you're working on a big film, they will have pictures of the actor's actual face and you'll use that but getting like the poor detail often they can't get a really high quality scan of the actor or actress um so they will um you'll use these maps kind of as secondary underneath the pictures of the actual actor's face um yeah so this is it's kind of just it's sort of normal workflow now for vfx especially if you're doing skin but they have some really great things here as well they've also got um where is it animals uh they've got these frog ones I'm going to say up front, these are not particularly cheap. Um, you are paying for incredibly good quality um, materials, but yeah, um, VFX, things cost. Um, but yeah, they they were really good. And so I kind of saw these and I was like, right, I'm going to try and combine these with hand sculpted displacement, especially because if we look at Squirtle, there's so many like, if you look at, let's look at an actual reference. If you look at an actual turtle, we've got all these tiny little dots. Now, I don't want to sit there for like a month hand sculpting every single one of those because at the end of the day, it's kind of tiled, right? Like it's the same dot here than it is there if you, unless you really squint and like properly look at it. Um, you're not really going to notice. So I knew for border shapes, right, let's have a look at this guy, this one I was using all the time. These I'm not going to get with the tiled texture. These kind of need to be placed by hand. Um, the detail on the beak, the kind of all this stuff. I'm going to need to hand sculpt that. But in other places, like, let's have another look. Uh, where's the one of the, the legs? A really good reference. Where are your legs? There, okay, cool. So like all these little bits, um, tile textures, absolutely. So I was, this was the kind of the first time that I was doing this. When I've used texturing XYZ before, it's usually just on a digital double at work and we use it everywhere. Whereas this time I was kind of, I was gonna try and combine hand sculpting in some places with XYZ in other places. Now this became a little bit of, it became a bit of a juggling act and it's absolutely not something that you're necessarily gonna have to do. It's just this asset because I knew there were some really good XYZ maps for some bits. Um, so it meant I was kind of working inside a ZBrush and Mari at the same time. If we have a look at Greg here, his entire face was done with XYZ. So I used there, they've got these amazing face textures. Um, which one's that? Multi-channel faces? The, one of these basically the skin textures that I just kind of projected on and then you have to clean up and you have to do um, work to it, but it just gives you a really nice base. So that for him, there was no kind of ZBrush hand sculpt. There was a little bit like I went in afterwards and added a few spots and like blemishes and stuff and like the folds around his eyes and things like that. Um, but kind of each asset will often be a bit unique. You'll kind of find your own workflow along the way. Um, so what's the point of this rambling? Well, basically, no two assets are ever going to be the same. Um, Trixie here, for example, I don't, I, she was sculpted in ZBrush to begin with low poly and there was never a high poly bait because it wasn't needed because I was trying to do like a plastic doll. Um, and then everything was textured in substance. This guy was inside of Mari because it was a lot of like organic stuff. Um, and whereas Greg here, um, all the clothes were done inside of substance. The skin was all done inside of Mari. The frog was all done inside of Mari. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of just, um, want to mention that you will often, you'll, it's hard to just be like, I'm going to use that person's workflow because a lot of assets can be quite individual, um, especially this guy was quite individual. And I found the same at work. You, this is kind of what I was saying earlier. It is a lot of problem solving because you'll be like, here's this asset. 
what's the best way to approach it? I know, I know quite a few pieces of software, but they're not all the best for everything. Um, so it's kind of picking and choosing your workflows. So yeah, um, let's have a look at do 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 painting displacement inside the height of Mari. So when I've got my low poly and I've got my um, UVs all laid out, then I can get it inside of Mari and I can start thinking about texturing. So because I'm using the texturing XYZ, then I'm going to be doing that inside of Mari and be using their projection tools because substance basically, like, let's not talk about substances, projection tools, I'll start getting PTSD flashbacks. Um, so basically all I'm doing, and the shell as well was using um, projecting scanned shell displacements on top, so I didn't have to hand sculpt that. Um, again, though, if, if I needed to, there would be ways to do that. I found actually a really cool method inside a substance designer, which I didn't think I would ever use that much, but I was using designer to kind of make this sort of faceted step shell thing um, at one point as well. So there's, there's always like a million and one ways to kind of approach the same asset and every artist will be different. So what I'm doing is I'm basically just projecting down this displacement data. So displacement, obviously white pushes out, black pushes in. So you can see this like stepping on the shell, that's gonna give me a nice displacement. Um, and then if we have a look at the body, so I'm doing exactly the same on the like the back of the head, for example, I'm projecting all these froggy spots on the back of the head because that's all gonna be tiled. All the front stuff I'm gonna leave empty and I'll just use my ZBrush displacement data for that. So um, yeah, you can see with the tail as well, I do the same thing. So um, where's my, okay, so ZBrush hand details. So these are, especially around the face and the muzzle, this is all the hand sculpted sort of detail stuff. It took a, <laughs> took a really long time. Um, and so this is on incredibly fast forward uh, because this is the reason why I was using XYZ is because I could just pop them down, use a tile protect, tile texture node, use a triplanar and I could get it done really, really quickly. Um, hand sculpt to detail, I mean, often it, because it's bespoke, because it's unique, it can look better. If you're not a great sculptor, it can look worse. I'm not the best sculptor. Um, use alphas, use other things to kind of combine on top to make it look better. Um, use Mari as well on top after you've got your ZBrush displacement start adding things on top of that. Like I added like chips and if we have a look at, let's see if we can get the, where's the high quality render? Sorry, I've got a really, really high quality render of um, this guy, like 5K that I was trying to get printed. So let's have a look at this. So if we can kind of see here, like all these little spots and stuff, it's on top of the ZBrush displacement, um, but, it wasn't done in ZBrush, it was added on top. So there's no reason you combine your workflows basically, use the best things of some pieces of software with the other things of others. Like there's no way I could have got that level of fidelity, like the, all these little bits of like keratin buildup inside a ZBrush. Um, but these larger like tiled, um, not tiled, what's the word? Scales, I guess, uh, that was inside a ZBrush. Um, and you can see here with the shell as well, I was using the projection, but then I kind of went over it in ZBrush as well to kind of get some of the lines a little bit deeper. Um, yeah, so this is all kind of tiled. We'll go back to the video and you can kind of see. All the stuff on the beak, I'm adding all the cracks, the cracks, sorry, by hand. Um, let's have a look. You see, always got the reference open there in one hand. Um, yeah, so that was the ZBrush workflow. And you can see here, so these legs, these were all tile textures, but if I just have a tile texture on there, the, the leg's gonna look incredibly flat. So what I did inside of ZBrush is I kind of sculpted in all these folds that I was seeing inside the reference. And then that way the ZBrush and the Mari um, displacements kind of marry together as long as I've set them up correctly inside of Mari or inside of Arnold, whatever you're rendering with. Um, cool, so next section, texturing. Um, I've just closed the folder that I was, what we looking at? Um, texturing, let's look at, so this is the color block in um, inside of Mari. So when I've got some displacement in there, you can kind of see it. Um, and now I'm just kind of playing, I've, I basically got, let's, let's assume the modeling is done. Um, and at this point, this is usually one of my favorite sections actually, I, I really do enjoy texturing. Um, and I can just kind of, this felt really creative because I'm looking at this squirtle here um, and I'm looking at this monstrosity of an ungodly squirtle that I've modeled and I'm trying to make it look, I'm, I'm just kind of playing around with like what works, what makes it look realistic, what makes it look like Squirtle, where do I, how do I kind of marry these things? So I'm just blocking in textures. Um, 
And so these videos actually they're from a larger gumroad course that um is it's it's quite cheap, but it is it does unfortunately cost. But this this blocking section is for free on my YouTube if you have any interest in seeing what I'm doing here, like fully narrated and um actually going up along. Um but yeah, then I'm also so let's talk about substance and Mari. Um again, this is something I've talked about. I've got a proper video on YouTube um where I compare the two. Um, this is something I, I could bang on about for days, um, and it's quite an important topic, I especially find when I'm talking to uni students or people like learning hobbyists and stuff like that. Um, people will often gravitate towards substance. They'll be like, oh, I want to be a text artist, so I'm going to learn substance. Sure, but the current state of the industry is that's not the case. Um, sorry, this has turned into like a TED, like a lecture about um, getting a job as a textual artist. The, the current state of the industry is you need to know Mari to be in the big houses, at least. If you want to get a job at ILM, you want to get a job at DNEG, you want to get a job at MPC, you need to know Mari. Um, and most of you, well, not most of you, but presumably a lot of you are studying VFX because you've seen those amazing films and you want to work on those big blockbuster films. So yeah, you do really need to know Mari. There's a couple of reasons for that. Mainly it works a lot better in a pipeline. You can do large UDIMs, you can do large, um, you can do 32-bit textures. Um, all these things that Substance can't do, it can project really nicely, which is very important for digi-doubles with texturing XYZ textures or with reference that you've got offset of like their faces. Um, it's incredibly important to know. Also, that said, however, Substance, it has really come into its own, especially, so that video I made on YouTube about Substance versus Mari was recorded April last year. And even since then, like Substance has got UDIMS, Substance has, it's got all these new features and it's getting better. Um, it's still not quite there yet, who's to say in three, four years, but the current state of the industry is you do need to know Mari, unfortunately, um, because substance is quite shiny and you can just drop a material in and be like, I've textured this, but you you, you have. Um, and that's one thing that I will often see. I would just see kind of like smart materials on an object. And it's like, I am, I want to be a texture artist. It's like, yeah, cool. But do you understand the maps that's going on underneath? And especially if you are just going to use substance, which is for, like my current job, I am only using substance. Um, that said, I wouldn't recommend it if you for getting a job on your CV. But um, if you are only going to use Substance, I do really recommend just understanding the fundamentals of what's going on behind those smart materials. Understand what a roughness map does. Understand what a normal map does. Understand what your diffuse color is and your metallic and your specular roughness. And understand you kind of need to know what a black value on a specular roughness does. And you need to know what a gray value does on a specular roughness. And if you don't know that, like the back of your hand, um, I mean, it's just, it's it's kind of the necessary information for a texture artist. And the problem is substance by default because it's so easy and it's so shiny. It's so easy to get amazing looking textures. It doesn't teach that. Whereas Mari is an absolute nightmare to learn. It's the worst. But it when you know Mari, you know how to texture. When you know substance, you don't necessarily. If you've learned it in the correct way, then maybe you do. But um, I find that often people take the easier route and they're like, ah, smart materials or whatever. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's the end of my Mari versus, Z, um, versus Substance rant. Um, I just think it's really important information to divulge. That said, they both have um, their pros and their cons. Substance is really good for hard surface stuff. So there might be a project where I'm only ever using Substance. Um, but in terms of like, get, in terms of a show reel, it says a lot more about you as a texture artist. If you can say, I know Mari, what this was textured in Mari, it just looks better. Again, that might change in four years, that might change in one year if Substance has an amazing update. And Mari is, it does feel a little bit like this, I don't wanna say dying, but like their, their updates aren't as quick and as thorough as Substance's are. So who knows where they'll both be in five years. But that was my texturing rant. Um, so when that's kind of all blocked in, um, one of the great things about having a really good displacement is a displacement can kind of um, do a lot of the texturing for you. So let me see if I can, can I move this bar? It's really in the way. Oh yeah, I can, cool, sorry. There's this uh, bar that's in the way. Um, so if we have a look, let's try and find my curvature map here. Where is it? It's one of the most beautiful things I think I've ever seen. Um, so this is all my sculpted detail and I put it into substance and I was like, right, here's the high poly, here's the low poly give me a curvature map. So if you've ever used Substance, you know what a curvature map is. If you've only used Mari, you might not be super familiar with the curvature map, but basically it just shows like white is the edge of a mesh, black is a cavity in a mesh. So you can see here all the cavities on these scales um, are black and all the, the kind of edges that I spent time kind of painstakingly sculpting gives me this ni nice white map. So what I can do is I can extract that information. I can start the texturing process for me super quickly. So you see me do that here. 
um, if we have a look, basically what I've done is I've taken that map and I've, I've extracted just the white data. So I've just got the edges of this curvature map. And then I am using it to, I mean, at the moment I'm just adding white, but I'm looking at my reference. I'm like, right, what can I, what do I want to add to the edges? Cause all the edges of this turtle are kind of worn away and I want some texture variation there. Um, so if we, let's just scrub through a little bit more. If we have a look. So you can kind of see here, uh, it's a little bit small, but the, the, in the crevices I've added a darker blue and on the edge, I've kind of added this like white texture detail. Now, I did absolutely nothing to get all that. Like uh, all I did is I connected like four nodes. Um, but because I spent so long on the sculpt and I've got a really nice sculpt, then all that information is given for me for free. And I, I do like to say a lot work smart and not harder. Um, why sit there and hand texture that when you've got all this amazing information? If you're the texture artist in, in uh, an office, maybe it's coming from another modeler, but if you've modeled it as well, then um, somebody else or you have, have done all that hard work already. Why not capitalize on it? Um, and I found there was a there was a um, project I worked on in Dinag Van that I think was cancelled, um, where I had to do this head, but it was like this fantasy creature, um, and the the sculpt was so good from the texture artist uh, from the modeler that was working on it. I was just texturing it. Um, all I did was just plug in a curvature map, and I just added some grunge into. It was like this really like haggard. It'd been out in like the kind of wastelands. Um, I just added like a, a tiling grunge into all the crevices of the skin and like um, this lighter color onto the top of the um, the like pores and stuff. And it was approved in like two days. And it was this like, it, sh it should have taken me weeks, but the they absolutely loved it. And that was just because I had all this amazing detail. Um, so yeah, often I will be quite reliant on ZBrush um, to give me a lot of texture detail. And if I feel there's not enough, I can always jump back and yada yada. Um, yeah. Um, so what else do I want to talk about? Let's talk about, so that kind of, kind of wraps up the modeling and texturing part of it. Like I, I just spent ages like kind of building this up. Um, and at the beginning it looked really crap. Like we can see, this is something I find, I'll, I will be working on something and be like, oh my God, this is so good. This is so bad. Um, especially because I have, a, now I have a, a slight internet presence of like, got a few YouTube followers and whatever. So I'm like, well, I don't want to put something out that looks bad because what are they going to think of me? And then I'll like, I'll carry on working on something and you just keep on working up and it looks better and better and better. Um, and it does just take that time. Um, but like we can see, this was one of the first passes and he looks like a penguin. Like, what is that? And it's one of these things, I just took a couple of days away from it and I was like, right, what isn't working here? And it was this beak, this beak was way too dark. And I was really reluctant. It was, it was a classic kill your babies moment. I was really reluctant. I was like, I want this dark beak. And why do I want that dark beak? Because um, there's a reference image here somewhere. I just really liked it on one of these turtles. I can't remember which one it is. Maybe it's this guy. He had like, he has like a dark beak under all this keratin. I was like, I want it to be dark. And he has like a red body. So I was like, cool, blue body, dark gray beak. It just looked bad. And so after a while, I we can go back to the, um, after a while, I, I messed around with it and I just sat there playing with it for a little bit and I've got a, cur a color that marries together a lot nicer. So you can kind of see the iterations that I went through. So it went from, I think this to, and I was playing around with some like shell variation like we saw in the ref, but it didn't work. So I tried a version with and without, much preferred it without. You can see I'm trying some breakup on the spots, which I kind of used, but nowhere near as harsh. Um, and then this is the shell as well on the back. I can't remember, did I keep that in the end? I don't know if I kept that. Um, but yeah, it went through many iterations and it's the same at work as well. You will often, you'll be on something day in and day out and it'll be like, right, we don't like this, we don't like that. And you just kind of have to be able to step away from your stuff and be like, look at it critically, what is and what isn't working. The great thing about being at uni is you've got students around you that you can just be like, hey, this render. Um, and I would really recommend, um, I don't know how um, you guys operate a confetti, but I would recommend either starting your own Discord. That's the cool thing the kids are doing these days. Um, we use Facebook back in the day, if you remember what that is. Um, or um, I don't know what else you could use, but just have a way. And we used to just, we had a little Facebook group, like there was 200 of us on it. And somebody would post something and be like, what do you think of this? And sometimes it would get ripped to shreds, uh, but never be rude to somebody's work. Always be constructive with the criticism. But be open to feedback because it's only ever going to make your work better. It's not, unless the person's written it badly, it's not a comment on your ability. It's not a common, it, you shouldn't take it as a hit to the ego. Um, I know that's something I struggle with sometimes at work when they're like, mm, I don't know. And you're a bit like, oh, are you saying that I'm bad at this? It's like, no, they're not. 
they just want it to look as good as possible and you should want your work to look as good as possible so you really be open to feedback um so i would wholeheartedly recommend if you don't have something like that already i'm sure you do but do, set something up with the students um with all of you guys um to feedback to each other's work because that's gonna you're gonna learn so much from each other so much more by listening to each other and getting feedback from each other. So I'm going to quickly, what I'll do is I'll finish off. I'm not going to talk about rendering or anything like that because I'm not particularly the greatest renderer. There's amazing videos online if you want to. Um, Arvid Schrana, Schneider, I think. Schneider. Um, he's really good with um, Arnold stuff. There's, there's so many people out there with amazing free content if you need, like, I don't know how to do that. Often it'll be like, oh, this, which button do I need to click here? And sometimes it won't be super obvious. So just like, just give it a Google. Um, so let's have a look at Over the Garden Wall Greg here. And so what I did during this project, I um, saved all the renders and they were roughly in the same kind of um, position as it was going. Uh, with, and it just gives kind of a nice breakdown of how this asset went. Uh, and let me just show you who Greg is. Do I did this open the PRF? Just in case you don't know. So um, you can see. My reference was very lack on this because I was just using Google all the time and I didn't actually save them into a thing, which is really annoying now because there was a specific frog reference I was looking for the other day and I can't find it. But anyway, so this is Greg. Um, and this was the ungodly version of Greg that I ended up making. Uh, he's got slightly elite battle eye angels, but elite battle angel eyes. But anyway, um, so let's just let's go through how let's break down how that went. Because um, I think it's really interesting. And I also think it was really bad to begin with. Um, so this was the first thing. And now I look at this and I'm like, <sighs> I was doing, I was doing this on Twitch as well. I think I was doing it and like, I'm telling people that I'm a professional VFX artist, but like, there's no, the anatomy doesn't work. Like the shoulders are really weird. The face looks like, what is this? It doesn't look cute. It just looks kind of creepy. Um, the hands are blocky, but I, I, they were really blocky at the time, but it was a work in progress. Um, and it was bad, but I made it look less bad. So that's the most important thing. Um, and then what did I do here? So you can see I've kind of curved out these elbows a little bit. Um, I was I worked on, I blocked in the frog at the beginning and this rock, which is, if you've seen the show, you'll know where that's from. Um, and the teeth on the head again, it's from the show. Um, it wasn't a weird design choice from my end. Um, and then I just spent a while playing with it and I was like, right, how can I make this look less creepy? Um, so I moved the nose around. You can kind of see, I got the, the lips a little bit fuller. Um, the eyes as well, there's something about, to begin with, I was just using spheres for the eyelids so I could kind of move them around. When I got them in and kind of merged up a little bit more, it looks a little bit more realistic. Also just getting eyebrows in helps so much. Just drawing black on his eye, eye lash, um, eyebrows really, really helped. So slowly it's taking shape. The hands are a bit more there. The body is still a little bit, the proportions aren't quite working. But again, it was like, it's quite a weird proportion kid. And it was that thing I was kind of finding the style along the way. I was like, how rotund do I want to make it, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I don't know that I nailed it in the final thing, but it definitely, it looks slightly better. Um, you can, I don't know what's changed there, the face slightly. Uh, and then, so when I had like a kind of blocked in shape, what I did is I took this into Maya again and re apologized broke away all the parts and re apologized it. All the clothing I did inside of Substance, because Substance is great for doing hard surface stuff really quickly. Um, but if you are going to use it, I recommend learning what your texture maps do. Um, I'm going to plug myself again. I've got a video on YouTube about that if you're at all interested, but often just doing your own research on, on your computer will help with that. Um, yeah, so I just got something quickly blocked in. And then at this point, I was like, maybe there is something here. Maybe if I can nail the face, like I think I can get something. This was the first render with like some textures on it. Looks really, really creepy. The eyes are too bright. There's no groom on it, obviously. He just looks a little bit scared. Um, the hands look very fleshy. Um, but slowly but surely, I just kind of started bringing, I would just look at a render, I would render it, I'd spend way too long in the evening looking at something and then I'd get, come back to my computer the next day with fresh eyes and be like, right, what's wrong? So on this, like, what's this leather material I'm doing on the shoes? That looks wrong. Obviously, I haven't touched the hands at this point. Um, the skin looks too subsurfacey. It looks a little bit weird. Um, the folds on the shirt look really wrong. Um, teapot looks kind of okay. But yeah, so it was, it was literally just that. Um, so you can see here, got some groom on, still looking a bit creepy because the eyes are a bit bright. Um, darkened them in this one. Uh, yeah, and slowly but surely. Added some laces because there weren't any laces. Added some candy. Um, played around the groom again, got slightly more because he has these very distinctive peaks. So I wanted to get 
that in, but then it became a bit anime. Um, added a satchel, gave him a smile because he was looking see, like a little bit creepy. Um, added this frog. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of changed the frog again, made it a bit more realistic, um, tried some textures. It looked a little bit blue and like dead, a bit gray. Um, tried changing the, the mouth position. It just looked a little bit like, so I just lifted it up ever so slightly and it did change it. Um, and I'm having like technical issues as well. Like here, the displacement is coming through from the other side of the collar. So I had to sit and work out why that was. Um, a lot of problem solving on this project. Um, you see here, then in the final thing, I shrunk the frog's head. Um, I also changed his position. It was really, really like cheated. But um, I, he was stood up very straight. And when it turned around, his back looks kind of odd. So I literally just used, I was like, at this point, I just want this out the door. Um, again, going back to that, I'm quite lazy thing. So I just used a lattice and kind of brought everything forward. And it squashed the frog's face down a little bit. And then I did it even more. And it just made the face a little bit cuter rather than, I don't know. Um, and this was, I think this is potentially the final render. Um, yeah, so I don't, that's kind of where I'm going to um, call this a day. I don't know if that was particularly helpful. That's just my creative process. That's how I approached it. If there's any key takeaways, references everything. If you need to know how something should look, reference is your first port of call. Um, if you don't have enough reference, find it. You don't need one-to-one -one reference, but um, find, if you're doing a metal teapot, find a reference for the shape of the teapot, the etchings on the teapot, the material response on the teapot, the uh, specular roughness of the teapot. That's four alone already for four different things about this teapot. Um, and I would have multiple images of multiple shapes of teapots and multiple etchings of teapots. I would So I would have 30 alone for the teapot, um, which I didn't for some reason in my pure graph. So I'm not following my own advice, but reference, um, block stuff in, uh, then retopo it, start sculpting it, start texturing it, and then just start chipping away at it when you're doing renders, keep going back to it. Like what's wrong? Ask your friends. My housemate used to be a VFX artist actually. So she was instrumental for this. She's got a really good eye for it. Um, so I'd just be like, hey, Amy. And she'd be like, yep, yeah, nose is too high. And that's what I do on my Discord as well. People will come with work. They're like, what's wrong with this? I'll be like, right, I actually think your, um, your pictorial muscle, muscle on this sculpt is too high. Or like, if you have a look at this reference, like the nose should be lining up with this, but your nose is blah, blah, blah. Um, and sometimes you just need to step away from your work to recognize the faults in it. Um, yeah. And I apologize for talking at you for so long. My throat is incredibly dry. Um, That's amazing. Thank you. I love seeing the process from the, the very first sculpt to this to the final one. It's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm so that. glad I kept a similar camera. Like if we have a look, let's do it side to side. Like you can see how bad this started. Um, uh, no, wrong thing. Yeah, I think when you see an amazing final render, you always think, oh, how did they get it it's so good? <laughs> they, must have, they must be incredible. But obviously when you see that process of it kind of... I do, yeah, I, I absolutely don't think I'm the best artist by any means. Um, I would never claim to be. There are some people online, I think it's either Damien, George, I didn't know how to say his last name, George Yu, or it was two guys. They were both at NPC when I worked there, so I confused them in my head a little bit. It was either him or there's another guy modeler, Nicholas Morrell, I want to say. One of those two guys, they, they make incredible work. I check it out, but he does a really good, th I think it's Nicholas. He does a really good thing where he takes pictures. He does the same render, exactly the same throughout. And he does like a gif of it by the end. You can kind of see the breakdown of his work. His always starts amazing and ends even more amazing. Um, whereas mine started bad, ended slightly less bad. Um, but yeah, I think those are, those are really important to see kind of like the process. Yeah, amazing. Um, just one very quick question that someone asked. Um, they said, yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Did Trixie respond to your fan art, they said? Um, she did. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if you um, guess what I've gotten really into in uh, lockdown, Drag Race and Pokemon. Um, yeah. And actually, I've watched over the battle more discussing many times. So this is somebody from uh, Drag Race, um, one of the most famous um, contestants now. And I just did this for fun because I was watching a lot of their, they have a YouTube series called, mm. I don't know how to pronounce it. It just, it's like a noise, mm, I think. I'm not gonna, anyway. Um, so I was watching a disgusting amount of that in lockdown. I was like, oh, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna do this. This will be a fun project to learn X-Gen with because of the giant drag race wigs, um, drag queen wigs. Um, yeah, and I posted it on Reddit 
Reddit is another really good one. If, you, if you're making fan art, especially, um, sorry, I know you said we could go 10 minutes over, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be really brief. Um, if you're making fan art, especially, I think Reddit can be a really great place to promote yourself a little bit, like post your stuff. Reddit's a funny one, don't go in there, obviously like self-marketing because they can smell it a mile off. But so I posted this on the Drag Race um, subreddit. I was just like, I'm a 3D artist. I've been watching loads of Ung um, and I made this. What do you guys think? And it was like the most upvoted that month, I think, by far. Um, <laughs> Squirtle was a slightly different story because I put it on the Pokemon one and it was just the the comments. They were very funny. They they did, they did meant well, but it was very much like, I, I need to unsee this. This is ungodly. Um, Greg was a little bit the same. I posted it on the Over the Garden Wall subreddit and some of them were like, this is creepy as hell. And then some of them were like, well, the show is kind of creepy, so it makes sense. Um, but it can be a really great way to kind of, um, I hate this term, but in terms of like engagement, especially now that I have a slightly online presence, like Instagram and stuff like that, it, getting people to go click through to stuff like that, it can, can help. Um, and with the Squirtle alone, I think I tripled my Instagram followers overnight just by posting it on Reddit. Um, and again, picked up by a couple of fan accounts and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, sorry, long story short, um, people went crazy on Insta on Reddit for it. Um, and then I tweeted it at her with a link in the Reddit. I was like, oh, if you want her to see this, then maybe just like this. And then she saw it, which was really cool actually. So yeah, it's funny, like something that you do in your bedroom, um, just as like a, a labor of love for something that you has like helped you in lockdown. And then it ends up getting seen by the people that, that, made it or created it i don't know it's a funny old job this yeah it's incredible yeah um what do you think we'll win the uk version oh bimini to wimini oh i bimini love to I love Laura, lawrence uh bimini not after is gonna win, right? not after last week uh i've got i've got thoughts and feelings i a horror uh anyway i don't oh, want to spoil it for people that haven't watched it but yeah no bimini or lawrence all the way <laughs> great um you know, horror? Oh, yeah no redemption arc of the year for sure <laughs> That's right. yeah to be fair they definitely got better um yeah Sorry. no don't worry i could talk about this for this can be the after yeah after we'll do show. this later <laughs> <laughs> um yeah were there any more is there any questions yes peer-to-peer -peer feedback sorry somebody's saying that in the the chat peer-to-peer -peer feedback um do you, i use a wacom um for um sculpting all the time i actually use the mouse for texturing these days unless i need to like physically paint something especially with node-based systems M mice are really helpful um yeah uh oh yeah i see a question there from sam who asked it's, it's looks like we missed one but he said what's the process like applying for a visa in canada so um, because i was moving internally at dneg it was really easy um and they kind of they did it all for me. I, they were like, we need these forms. We need your university degree. We need your proof of education, proof of where you've worked and all that. Um, birth certificate, well, maybe not birth certificate, passport, all that. And then their lawyers did it for me. Um, I had to be sponsored because it was a, I don't know how the visas work now, but it was a high skilled worker visa. So you have to be sponsored through a company or whatever. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I was really lucky that they just did it all for me. Is it, like, is it like a lottery? Not a lottery, but they, do they only have a certain amount of visas? No, can... so there is there is also the, the lottery system as well, which is if you're under 30, um, again, I don't know how COVID will have affected this, but um, previously, if you were under 30, you could apply for a, I can't remember if it's one or two years, you can apply for, I think it's a two year visa, um, anyone, and you can, um, it's actually kind of a better visa because you can work anywhere. Whereas I was like stuck at Dean, not stuck. I, I really liked working at DNEG, but if, if I was let go, I had to leave the country basically, or I had to be sponsored by another company. Whereas with the two year one, you can work in Starbucks and then the next week you can work at Dean Egg and then the next week you can work in a library. You can work anywhere. Um, but then by the time you're 30, you have to go. But then when you've been in Canada for two years, uh, for one year, you can apply for permanent residency anyway. So you, a lot of people just get in, especially people that worked in production because they weren't classed as highly skilled. Again, I'm air quoting because I don't wouldn't say what I do is necessarily highly skilled, but um, um, production people weren't classified by the Canadian government as highly skilled so they would come over on the 30 under 30 visa and then get PR so they didn't have to worry about any of that um, yeah yeah cool again Amazing. it could have changed since all right I guess we'll um, wrap it up there then so thank you very much Michael uh, no really worries. appreciate your time and the insights um, that you've given and 
I'm, I know lo lots of our students already follow you, your stuff and post on your Discord and watch your YouTube channels. And yeah, stuff. so and I'll just quickly not promote that again, but I will just say um, if there's anything that I haven't covered that you want to ask, do hop and um, like my email address and stuff are available online. Um, but I find, especially at the moment, I'm not responding to those anywhere near as quickly as I used to. So I've just been snowed under with a lot of stuff. But pop on the Discord. Um, I try and answer every question. Last couple of weeks, I've fallen behind a bit. Um, and I try and be as candid as I can online. Um, and um, yeah, uh, don't just don't DM me because I find they kind of like get lost into oblivion. And I also really like the idea that on Discord because everybody can see it, everybody learns from it as well. Whereas if I responded to a hundred DMs of like the same question, I can do it a lot quicker and teach a lot of other people. Um, yeah, so yeah, sense. but also feel free to message. I have people, I'm not saying don't message me on LinkedIn or whatever, because I'm absolutely fine with that. But if you've got questions, the best place, head over to that Discord. There's a link somewhere on YouTube. Perfect. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. It's been so good to see you again. No worries. Thank Great. you. We'll let you go. All so right. thanks guys, we'll see you um, in our next event and Michael, I'll speak to you later. <laughs> okay, am I am I Bye, leaving everyone. now? Do I leave the... Oh yeah, you leave, yeah. Okay. Go. Yeah, you can leave. Right. <laughs> thanks so much everybody. Bye. Cheers mate. Bye. Bye.